across Americas and around the world, coming to you from the beautiful White Mountains of Arizona. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the discoveries that we made, that we made on our recent trip, and uh, how about that? If you're wondering what's going on here, <laughs> Carolyn wasn't getting any sound through her headphones, and that sort of threw me off for a minute until I found out what the problem was. We're going to be talking tonight about what we found on our trip to the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. And, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think you're going to find this just absolutely, absolutely incredible. In fact, you may not believe what you're going to hear, because, quite frankly, when I was standing there looking at it, I can tell you I did not believe what I saw. Driving across the desert of Nevada, approaching from the Boulder City Highway, looming off in the distance is an incredible sight. If you did not absolutely know where you were at, you would tend to believe that you were delirious and had somehow been transported to the desert of Egypt. Rising up above the city of Las Vegas is a black reflecting huge pyramid easily as big as the Great Pyramid of Cheops in Egypt. On the top of this pyramid is a crystal capstone, or what appears or looks like crystal capstone, reflecting the sunlight in every direction. If you've ever looked at a polished piece of black obsidian volcanic glass that might give you some idea of what the surface of this pyramid looks like. As you travel closer along the highway, you begin to see looming up in front of the pyramid an exact replica of the Sphinx. And in front of the Sphinx, towering approximately 150 feet in the air, the phallus of Osiris, an obelisk, for those of you who have not followed our series on the mysteries. And if you don't know what an obelisk is, I'm sure you're acquainted with the Washington Monument. The site is absolutely awe-inspiring. The sheer size of this structure is overwhelming. It covers an area so large that driving around it, one begins to wonder how in the world this could have ever been built, much less built in the short period of time. that it was, in fact, assembled. During the time that the Luxor Hotel was under construction, a huge fence surrounded the area. They had armed guards on patrol. No one was allowed to watch the construction or see what was going on, except that part which loomed above the fence. No visitors were allowed. 
to watch the construction, and no press was given access. When we first drove to the Luxor, went around this huge, tremendous complex upon which this hotel sits, and then finally went across the street, parked the car, put our press passes on the front of our garments, got out with our video cameras. I looked directly across the street and was confronted with the head of Tutankhamun, who then promptly winked at me. Everything about this ninth wonder of the world, for it truly is, I can assure you, leaves one with a sense of awe, a sense of disbelief, overwhelming beauty. It is, in fact, beautiful beyond description. What I'm trying to do here is convey to you what I saw, and there are not words enough to do it. Now, if you've listened to our series on Mystery Babylon, you know that the Egyptian pyramids were never tombs. They were not burial places or crypts for the bodies of kings or queens or anyone else. They were temples, great temples of the mystery religion, and they functioned for the purpose of initiation. I can assure you that the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas is a temple of initiation for the masses, the millions upon millions of people who visit that city each year. Probably billions. Not just from America, but primarily from America, but also from around the world. For every single bit of symbolism connected with the mysteries is built into this hotel. Beginning with the obelisk, which represents the generative force, The Sphinx, which is to remind mankind that he is, after all, only an animal, you can think, and therefore is always engaged in this constant battle between the animal and the intellect. And then the great temple of initiation, the Pyramid. This one with capstone intact crystalline in nature, representing as the sun reflects and glints off of every faceted side of it, representing the all-seeing eye. To give you some idea of the size of this structure, inside the building on the ground floor, Nine Boeing 747s would fit comfortably with no crowding and no problem. Nine Boeing 747, and those are the huge passenger jets. Nine. Inside the building there is an obelisk which begins at the lowest floor, which is below the ground floor actually, begins on the lowest floor, comes up through the casino, onto the upper deck and points directly at the center apex, the zenith of the pyramid, is another obelisk. It is an incredible sight, ladies and gentlemen. Everywhere you go, there are Egyptian hieroglyphics, 
themes, themes of all of the ancient gods. Remember I told you all the old gods are returning? Boy, are they ever. The whole story of the Osirian cycle is unfolded. The Nile River is there. And in fact, the Nile River circumnavigates the entire lower level. And they have great Egyptian barges upon which people ride around the outside, inside perimeter of this great pyramid. The rooms are all built into the outer walls. There are no rooms inside the walls. They are in the walls of the pyramid, and each floor is on a level that jets out above the floor below it, all the way up. The elevators are inclinators, and they travel up to the different floors. Four elevators are inclinators, one at each corner of the pyramid. The space inside this building is awesome. It's overwhelming. As you travel up the escalator and walk down the steps into what appears to be a city within a pyramid, in the midst of which is this huge obelisk pointing toward the apex above, lasers of different colors flash and cross the air in front and around and over you, everywhere you go. There are lights, and there are television sets every which way you turn, of every conceivable size, until you finally stand and you're looking up at the side of what appears to be a skyscraper inside this pyramid, on the side of which is a huge television screen, And it reminds you of George Orwell's 1984. That immediately comes to mind. For everywhere you look, there are eyes and television sets. Just as what was described in 1984. Or in Huxley's Brave New World. There is no doubt whatsoever that the people who built this resort hotel were not only well-versed in the mysteries, but were experts, are experts in the mysteries. They understood everything. There is a three-chapter episode consisting of three different rides or experiences, whatever you want to call it, called The Search for the Obelisk. And everywhere there are screens giving you little previews of these three different episodes or chapters. You need three different places to go to experience this over a period of time. And they are urging you to come join the quest. If you read my book and if you paid attention during the mystery series broadcast of the hour of the time, you know that at the heart and soul of all of what's happening in the world is the order of the quest. Benjamin Franklin talked about the Order of the Quest. He, in all actuality, was a member of the Order of the Quest. He was also a Freemason. He was also the Grand Master of the Lodge of Nine Muses, Thomas Jefferson. 
was a member of this Order of the Quest, as was George Washington, and just about everyone of our forefathers. Come join the quest. It's all about the discovery, 12,000 feet below the desert, of an ancient ruin, of an ancient civilization, where they find levitating craft. Does that sound familiar? Any connection here with UFOs? Any connection with Hitler's belief that the Aryan race represented the survivors of a lost civilization far advanced beyond what we are now? And that in this ruin... Also, this rings of the tales of the inner earth. In this ruin, they supposedly found a crystal obelisk, which was stolen, by the way, by a Dr. Osiris, who now holds the key to the future of the earth and mankind. And everywhere you look are these plaques or emblems of the enlightened Society for Global Transformation. The Enlightened Society for Global Transformation. You can stop and get a burger and a Coke or a beer or whatever you want, in fact. The Millennium Cafe. I found it at first to be difficult to understand what was going on around me and to, in fact, keep from bumping into people because everyone was so preoccupied with looking up or looking behind them that we were all constantly bumping into each other. Men, women, children, didn't matter. Temples, emblems of the snake were everywhere. Now, on that first day, I very wisely retreated to get my wits about me. I took a little bit of information with me. Did not do any filming, except from across the street. We filmed the whole outside of the hotel. Nothing inside at that point. Because, to tell you the truth, we were a little overwhelmed and didn't quite know where to start. I wondered how in the world this had come about. I found out through asking questions that the hotel and the grounds, the complex, the Sphinx, the obelisk, everything, had cost $400 million. Paid for in cash. Not one penny was taken out in loan to build this hotel. Now, if you ever had dreams of going to Las Vegas to win your fortune... I would suggest you take those dreams, put them in an iron box, lock them up, and throw them in the deepest river that you can find. For that $400 million, ladies and gentlemen, represents only the Luxor Hotel, and it came out of the pockets of all of the visitors to Las Vegas who had visited these hotel casinos. The Circus Circus Hotel Casino, the Excalibur Hotel Casino, the Slots of Fun Casino in Silver City Casino, the Circus Circus Hotel Casino in Reno, Nevada, the Colorado Bell Hotel Casino in Laughlin, and the Edgewater Hotel Casino in Laughlin. For it is the group that owns this conglomerate of hotels that built the Luxor. And it became no surprise to me to find out that it was Circus Circus, which had also built the Excalibur Hotel. If you listen to our series on the mysteries, you know that the Roman Circus was built to take the attention of the people away from the emperor, to give them the games to quench their thirst for blood and excitement, 
so that when they went home at night, they were exhausted and didn't feel like rebelling and served the emperor well for hundreds of years. So they built the Circus Circus Hotel in Las Vegas. And then they built the Slots of Fun Casino, the Circus Circus Hotel Casino in Reno, the Colorado Bell Hotel Casino in Laughlin, the Edgewater Hotel Casino in Laughlin, and then they went back to their theme and built the Excalibur Hotel in Las Vegas, which has to do all about the legend of King Arthur and the search for the Holy Grail. Another quest. The Holy Grail and the Mysteries has nothing to do with the cup that Jesus drank out of at the Last Supper. The Holy Grail and the Mysteries, in fact, represents the bloodline of the House of David. Those believed by the Mysteries to have the divine right to rule. I've said this many, many times before. I will say it again. Whoever rules the world in the New World Order, will they claim to the ancestry of the house of David. And then the Luxor, the ultimate temple of initiation that has ever been built throughout history. The shows that you go to in this hotel are beyond description and You'll have to wait until you can get a chance to visit the Luxor, and I advise you all to do it. You will see verification in front of you everywhere you turn of everything that I've ever told you on this broadcast about the mystery religion of Babylon. It's all there. Nothing has been left out. As you go from show to show, you are indoctrinated slowly into the mysteries. You are told that if mankind does not change now, that the future will be bleak, if not non-existent, for mankind upon this earth. Everywhere you hear the phrase repeated, now is the time, now is the time, now is the time. The same phrase that kicked off the French Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution is now being heard in America. And the great quest, the search for the crystal obelisk in these shows, is really, symbolically, the search for God. For the obelisk represents the generative force, the force of creation that makes things happen. Gets things done. And what you ultimately discover, and by the way, the discovery, as far as I could see, was only made by a few, is that there is no God, man is God. That's the theme, and that's what you learn. If you're paying attention. Most people that I saw were completely baffled. They had no idea what they were going through and couldn't even figure out the, the story. <laughs> and that was amazing. It's amazing, it's, it's entertaining, and it's very, very sad to watch sheeple trying to deal with this great esoteric religion that's all around them and not understanding one single piece of it. I saw it everywhere I went. People would come out of the first episode scratching their head and looking around and wondering what it was all about. What happened here? What, you know, it was a fun ride and and I gotta tell you folks, the ride on that first episode Well, I can't describe it. I will tell you this. If 
You've never been on a ride like it in your life. I can guarantee you that. It is virtual reality. And by the way, they have a virtual land there where you can pilot an F-14 Tomcat if you want. And I mean, when it goes up, you go up. <laughs> if you do a flip, if it does a flip, you do a flip. And you're in that cockpit. And you take off, and you land, or you crash, or you, you go straight up and until you stall and fall back down to the earth. This is an incredible place. Now, when I did the episode explaining the meaning of the movie 2001, and that's why I used that music again in this program to remind you all of that. When I explained to you the meaning of 2001, in that movie there was an obelisk, a monolith, a stone, black, remember? Smooth, shiny, everything was reflected in it. And remember when the astronaut went out to investigate it, he couldn't find an opening, and finally he pulled up a piece of it, looked inside, and there was another universe. Well, i got news for you, folks. That stone makes up, on the inside, a huge monolith. Just like in the movie 2001. Perfectly polished. As black as black could ever possibly be in your wildest, darkest nightmares. And it reflects everything that goes on. All of the lights and the laser beams that are flashing through the air are all reflected in this shiny, polished, smooth black stone. It resembles the stone in the meditation room of the United Nations. You really must go and see this, folks. It is a necessity for your education. If you can't go, we filmed it all. It's probably some of the most wonderful, beautiful, fantastic footage that I've ever taken. And we're in the process of assembling a video which you will be able to obtain from us, and I'll tell you how to do that later in the program. In the meantime, if you'd like to call and make your reservations, the number is 1-800-777-0407. That's 1-800-777-0407. Don't go away. I'll be right back. What you're hearing tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is the indoctrination of the masses, the sheeple, into the exoteric meaning, not the esoteric, mind you. Only those of us who have been studying that for many years really understand what we're looking at. But the public is being prepared for the new world religion. Make no mistake about that. I was on the phone with Craig Smith this morning, called to find out how the trip was. And we discussed this at some length. And he was amazed, and I felt myself, and I don't feel this too often, folks, totally inadequate to explain to him what is happening there. And we all must prepare for what's coming, for what is coming for many of us, is not going to be good. Many people will embrace the New World Order and the New World Religion. They will not have to think anymore. They will not have to be responsible. Of course, they will have no freedoms. But Daddy will take care of them. Their every need will be furnished as long as they do what they're told, when they're told, how they're told, and worship the God that they're told to worship. Those people will be happy, but many of us will not be happy under those circumstances, and we need to prepare ourselves for the hardships, 
a trauma that is coming. And sure, as I'm speaking to you tonight, it is coming. A visit to the Luxor Hotel will bring this home to you quickly, quicker than anything that I can think of. And when you see the Excalibur right next door, and down the street, the Circus Circus, all built by the same people, and all right out of the control mechanism of the ancient mystery religions of Babylon. You need to prepare, folks. You know, people kept asking us to try to get some way where they could lay up a one or two year stock of food so that when things got tough, and if you don't believe that they will, Nintendo just moved its Seattle plant to Mexico. Remember I told you this was going to happen. It's going to continue to happen. They laid off 137 people. But that's just one of the first of many who will be doing this. We went out and contracted, negotiated, looked. <laughs> finally, finally found this food storage company that would give us a tremendous price break so that we could pass it on to you. We let you know about it. Many of you sent in requests for the information. We sent it to you. Not one person is taking advantage of it. So we're going to let it go. And you're going to have to pay retail for this stuff. Now, there's something besides food that you have to do, and many of you have been taking advantage of that. I don't know why this is, but more people in this country care more about their pocketbook than they do about the Constitution or the Bill of Rights that gave them the opportunity and the privilege, the right, not privilege, but right, to make the money and accumulate the assets to have a pocketbook, to have a bank account, to have the things that they have. They're always most concerned about that. And to an extent, rightly so. The priorities must come in this manner, ladies and gentlemen. I said it in my book. Number one, number one, I am dedicated to God. Number one, first and foremost, above anything and everything else. Number two, to the Constitution and Bill of Rights. And number three, to my family and loved ones. And people look at me and tell me I'm crazy. Well, I tell you, that's the only thing that makes sense. Without God, we have nothing. Without the Constitution and Bill of Rights, we will be slaves. And family and loved ones won't make much difference. So God must come first, Constitution and Bill of Rights must come second, and the family and loved ones must come third. You take care of God and the Constitution, and your family will be okay. But we haven't done that, so we're going to be experiencing some very, very bad times in the near future. So most of you need to now call Swiss America Trading and talk to them about how you can save at least some of what you have so that you can provide for yourself and your family during the upcoming economic traumas. Call 1-800-289-2646 and do that now. Don't do what you did with the food. We worked really hard to get a contract with a food storage provider, Ready Reserve Foods. We got steeper discounts than they've ever given anyone and steeper than anyone, any other food storage company would give. And we passed that on to you and nobody took advantage of it. Don't pass up the opportunities that Swiss America Trading has available for you. 
Don't do that, folks. For when everything crashes down around your ears, the paper money you have in your pocket will be meaningless, will be worth nothing. You will not be able to find anything that you can trade for a loaf of bread, unless it's your house, your car, if you still have one. You see, whatever you have is what it's going to cost you. Prepare. Call 1-800-289-2646. Do it right now. Don't wait until tomorrow. You know how you are, and so do I. When you go down to the lower level, the murals of Egyptian life cover the entire walls of this stairwell, which also, by the way, has escalators. It goes down to the base of the obelisk, which goes up through several floors and then up into the center of this great pyramid and points directly to the apex. At one point I was watching the laser light show when all of a sudden a small port opened in the apex of the pyramid and a pure shaft of light connected with the tip of the obelisk. And a chill went right up my spine and the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I felt this terrible fear in my belly, knowing that these people are not playing games. I was even more taken aback when all those standing around who had witnessed this laughed and giggled and pointed and thought this was just another wonderful part of the entertainment. Having no conception of what they were witnessing. Luxor, by the way, means the source of light. When I went down into the very lowest level, there is a shop there called The Source of all kinds of Egyptian paraphernalia, books on the translation of the different hieroglyphics and papyrus that have been found throughout Egypt on the monuments and the tombs on the pyramids. The Translations of the different stelae, including the Metternich stel, which the stel group is named after. Next to that is a museum. There's a complete reproduction of Tutankhamun's tomb. Then I began to see these photographs of dancing girls and men in chariots. And these were photographs. These were not paintings or prints. These were photographs. And then I saw double doors above which the words theater was displayed. I again penned on my press pass, went through those doors and down in the bowels of this huge, gigantic pyramid was a recreation of the Roman circus. And at night they have huge pageants. The one that's advertised is called the Winds of the Gods. The Winds of the Gods. And at one point, the wall of this huge, tremendous circus in which you could place a football field opens up and they create the Nile River running through this auditorium. Everywhere there are people who will answer your questions and if you take the boat ride on the tour of the Nile you will see recreations of all the great monoliths of Egypt and they will tell you the story 
of the Osirian cycle. Of Nut and her children, Isis and Nephthys, Osiris and Set. And at one point you will see the guardian of the secrets of the universe displayed upon the wall. If you don't look up high, you won't see it. The only other place you see it is in the first episode of The Search for the Obelisk. This creature has the exact same facial characteristics and the exact same eyes as the supposedly alien creature on the cover of Whitley Strieber's book, Communion. I told you... Actually, years ago, when I first began my lecture tours, and all during these radio broadcasts, that all of these things are tied together. They are linked, just as your toe is linked to your head. You may look at your toe and say, that's a toe, it has nothing to do with my head. And so you try to cut it off, and then you will find very quickly that it has everything to do with your head. You cannot separate the UFO phenomenon, or the stories about aliens visiting the Earth from the New World Order, or from the mystery religions, or from Las Vegas, any more than you can separate your toe from your head without understanding at that point that you've made a big mistake. In the Luxor, you can see all of this come together. It comes together very well. You might want to go out and get the latest issue of Time Magazine, the February, or excuse me, the January 10th, 1994 issue of Time Magazine. That's the January 10th, 1994 issue of Time Magazine. On the cover, you will see what I'm talking about. And one of the things that I noticed inside the Luxor Hotel is that this could be the city of the future. People could live, work, eat, sleep, be entertained, be born and die, all within that pyramid. All within that pyramid. Something else was going on, ladies and gentlemen, that was insidious in nature. Remember, I told you this is a temple of initiation into the new world religion, the new age religion, into the new, the brave new world, as Aldous Huxley would have called it and did call it in his book. It came a decade late for George Orwell, but nevertheless, it is the same. People are herded like cattle through these through these things that they pay to see. They're treated like stupid sheeple. And something else occurs that was so significant, I looked around me and could not believe that no one there but me understood what was happening. You go down to the lower level to a counter there, and you buy your ticket for these things. And everything has to have this ticket. You are told to hold the ticket in your right hand. It has the UPC on the ticket. You're told not to hold it in your left hand. You must hold it in your right hand with the UPC facing outward from your hand. Every time you go into one of these events, one of these rides on the Nile River ride, or the three episodes, or anything, there's a scanner, under which you are told to pass your hand, and it reads the UPC code on the ticket. There is 
an attendant standing there. They will not take your ticket and pass it under the scanner for you. You are to do that. It is a form of indoctrination getting you used to passing your hand under a scanner to get something in return. It is a Pavlovian conditioning. You do it enough, you think nothing of it. And eventually that ticket will disappear, and whatever is being scanned will be in your hand. You see, even when you have trouble and you're not holding the ticket right, they tell you to pass it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, try it again. Only when it becomes obvious that people behind are getting very upset with you holding up the line will the attendant take the ticket and pass it under the scanner for you. For this is a form of conditioning. You cannot be conditioned if they do it for you. Everything in the Luxor Hotel is an indication of what is to come. Everything. I went into the casino on this day. I forgot to tell you, I was filming. Filmed everything. Wore my press pass and went everywhere. Anywhere I wanted to go. I was treated courteously. People opened doors for me. People offered to set up props for me. In the casino, around the center where the obelisk goes up through the ceiling, there are all the reproductions of the beautiful golden mummy cases and the masks, the death masks. I turned around and saw two obelisks on each side of a small stairway and a jackal. And then the door in front, which looked like a tomb, was actually an elevator that goes up one floor into the Isis, the Isis restaurant. So I went up there. It was too dark to videotape up there, but I took still pictures, and they will be in the videotape. We will videotape the still pictures. It is one of the most beautiful foyers that I've ever seen with ancient Egyptian art, pieces of jewelry and glass cases. On each side of the entryway into the actual restaurant are the huge stone reproductions of Egyptian gods. There are brass, they look like gold, and I, they may be gold-leafed, snake heads on the ends of all the furniture, cobra, inside in a glass case with a beam of light shining directly down on it is a statue of Isis in all her glory, it's ornate, dripping with wealth and affluence. Everything, dear listeners, is designed to take you out of yourself and surrounded by all of this symbolism indoctrinate you into the New World Order. And you're so astounded and awed by the beauty of all of this that you fail to see the methods of control and the terrible religion and the God that you will be asked to bow to. And I'm a true constitutionalist. If you really wanted to bow to that God, I would fight for your right to do it. whether I proved or not. For I came to understand many years ago that if I deny you the right to practice your religion, you could also deny me the right to practice mine. I have no qualms with people practicing the religion they wish to practice. The problem I have 
is being lied to and deceived and manipulated into doing things and believing things and accepting the loss of freedoms and sovereignty through deception and lies and cunning wit. For the most part, being enacted upon an unsuspecting, trusting people. That I despise. And I know that whatever new order or new world they create, through these types of procedures, will not be the utopia that they promise that it will be will not be a wonderful world free from crime. No, ladies and gentlemen, it will just be another mountain of lies built upon the last mountain of lies. And someday, somewhere, someone is going to expose the original lie upon which all of this was built, and the whole structure will come tumbling down. I hope that the hour of the time is functioning in some way toward that end. Only you know the answer to that. I am constantly amazed that all of this is flaunted in front of the people. You see, it's all out in the open now for anyone who cares to look. And from our research, we found that it's never really been hidden during this century. Of course, the manipulations are built upon masterful lies. But if you want to do the research and look, you'll, you can always find the truth behind the lie because it's not hidden. The way that they've been able to get away with all of these things is very simply they believe and in most instances they're right that most people don't want to think for themselves and will never look therefore they don't even hide anything that's a shame it is in fact an indictment of all all of the American people and the people of the world. It's always been my hope to be able to wake the sheeple so that they become real people whom we can then empower to save the penultimate achievement of all of mankind, and that is the document that for the first time in the history of the world, truly set man free. Gave him the greatest opportunity and created the greatest civilization, the greatest nation that's ever existed upon the face of this earth. And now everyone is willing to flush it down the toilet, literally, and step back into slavery. Why? At night, the Luxor lives up to its name and is truly the source of light. As darkness falls, and they turn on the mechanism at the apex of the pyramid, the brightest light I have ever seen in my life, or that anyone on this earth has ever seen besides the sun, shines up through the center of the crystalline capstone and a pure white beam of light, a shaft of light reaches up into space, and it is, it is one of only two natural man-made structures that can be seen from space. One is the Great Wall of China, and the other is the Luxor Light. On a clear clear night with a dust-free atmosphere, the light can be seen as far away as Los Angeles and Phoenix, Arizona. It is truly awe-inspiring. Photographs of it 
are awe-inspiring. Never mind being there in person, just looking at a photograph of it will take your breath away as you realize that the light is so strong that on a clear night in clear air with no dust and no smog and no smoke, you can still see the beam of light as if it's a column, a translucent column, reaching far out into space. Good night. And God bless you all. If in the eyes of the great worldwide brotherhood, now is the time, then this is the hour of the time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. And we're going to go right straight to Phoenix right off the bat, because you haven't had a metal report in some time. Gene Miller, are you there? Well, thank you, Gene, once again, for a wonderful uh, report on what's happening in precious metals. And uh, be here again next Monday. I'll do it. Okay. Welcome back once again. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Folks, if you're wondering what happened there, we had a little power outage, and uh, for a few seconds we didn't know whether we were on the air or not, and uh, we are, so we'll continue. Make sure you have pad and pencil by you, and don't you dare move. One of the first things that visitors to Las Vegas, Nevada see today is one of the strangest sights and one of the most unusual sights that you would ever expect to see in the United States of America. It is a huge, and I mean huge, pyramid. It's not made out of stone. It's made out of concrete and steel. The outside is covered with a black glass. It looks it looks very much like a huge, polished, obsidian stone capped with a crystal capstone. When the sun's rays strike the capstone at particular angles, it sparkles and throws out rays of light like a diamond. In front of this huge pyramid, is an exact replica of the Sphinx. And in front of that is the ages-old symbol of what began in the legends of the death of Nimrod and proceeded into Egypt in the Osirian cycle and represents the golden penis that Isis substituted upon the throne of her lover, husband, brother, after he had been murdered by Set or Typhon, as some call him, chopped into fifteen pieces and scattered over the land. She found fourteen, but could not find the last, the phallus, the generative force, that which is the creative power. God, if you will. So she fashioned a golden phallus and substituted that on the throne or on the altar of Egypt in the place of the slain Osiris. It stands in the outer courtyard of the Vatican within the circle of the Temple of the Sun. It stands in ancient Egypt. It stands in London and on the grounds of Sion House in Great Britain. It stands in Central Park in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas and in Washington, D.C. and is known there as the Washington Monument. I'm speaking of the obelisk. During the vacation Days, my wife and I and Pooh went to Las Vegas to film the Luxor Hotel. Luxor means the source of light. And I tell you now that in a literal sense, it is the source of many different lights, depending upon what kind of light you are searching for. If you understand the symbology, you could become illumined 
while there. If you don't understand the symbology, you could continue worshiping at a stone altar, which can neither hear nor speak, nor grant, nor grant the subject of your prayers. At night, through the crystal capstone, the brightest light on earth shines directly up into space. And it is so bright that even on a clear night, with no dust or particles or smog in the air, it appears to be a solid, translucent column of light. It is awesome. It is awesome. The light shining through the black glass of the facade of the pyramid give the impression of a thousand points of light. coming from the night sky beneath the illumined capstone. It is one of only two man-made objects which can be seen from space. One is the Great Wall of China, the other is the Luxor Light. It is, in fact, a temple of initiation for all of the billions of people who visit Las Vegas, Nevada each year in many more ways than one. People are being indoctrinated into the ways of the New World Order and the New Age religion. It is a fact. It is not conjecture. We have documented it. We have the most astounding, most beautiful video footage that I have ever taken. We will be making that available to you. For those of you who want to order it in advance of the completion of assembling the tape, it will be $30.00. Post paid for non CAGI members and $25 post paid for CAGI members. The tape will be one hour in length. If you can, I encourage you to visit Las Vegas and visit the Luxor Hotel. If you are interested in the history of the Illuminati and the future of the world, you will get quite an education while you are there. If you are sheeple, you will have a good time. You will wonder at the magnitude and the colossal construction and the great expanse of space inside where you could, in fact, park nine Boeing 747s side by side without any crowding whatsoever. You would think, gee, this is nice, a 400 million dollar playground. In fact, folks, it is a temple of initiation for an ancient religion to prepare the masses for what is to come. Now, since I've covered almost everything that we saw in Las Vegas earlier, in the early program, which airs at 5 Pacific, 6 Mountain, 7 Central and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm not going to repeat all of that in this program. Those of you who did not catch that program, I encourage you to order the tape. Either the tape of the earlier broadcast tonight or the videotape. The videotape will be tape number 33 in the Mystery Babylon series. I think that when you see this tape, you will agree with me that it is the best that we could possibly provide for the mystical number 33. I'm going to open the phones now, folks, and we'll talk about this. And I think we've got somebody on the line right now. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello, Mr. Cooper. Yes. I'm out here in California. And the last show I uh, caught you on was just before Christmas. Since that time, um, WWCR lost the frequency, and I've been unable to tune you in. What frequency are you on tonight? WWCR has not lost the frequency, and we're on the same frequency, 5.810. And we've been broadcasting twice a night, every night. And, uh, okay, and you're still on at uh, 9 p.m. Pacific time. That's correct. 5.810. That, that's right, the same frequency. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Good night. Carolyn, you saw the video footage that we took. Would you like to describe it for our listeners? Well, 
If you remember, I was totally silent throughout the watching of the videotape. It, it is just uh, awesome. Uh, you don't really know what to say. Um, it so happens that I had a good course in history in, about Egypt when I was in the eighth grade, and it all just comes right back to light when you see it there on the video. Um, if you understand the symbology, you realize just what the world, what our country is, is moving into. And um, it may be beautiful, but there's a total feeling of horror that uh, engulfs you. It is a beautiful hotel. There's no doubt gorgeous. about that. Just gorgeous. $400 million paid for in cash. It is, well, it's, it's, uh, I'm not surprised by hardly anything. Nothing shocks me. Nothing surprised me. I'm not in awe of, of hardly anything ever. And, uh, I was dumbstruck by this. Uh, outside, inside, everything was just absolutely incredible. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, hello. Uh, this is Bill Cole, from Louisiana. Uh -huh. I, I was wondering how that compares to the Memphis Pyramid that was built. The Memphis Pyramid is nothing compared to this. Oh, In okay. fact, after you see the Luxor Hotel, you'll never look at the Memphis Pyramid again in your life. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I was just wondering about size or anything like that. It is the most incredibly huge, most beautiful, most well-constructed, most awe-inspiring site that I have ever seen. It's truly the eighth wonder of the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Number 602-333-2174, if you've never called before and would like to know the number, 602-333-2174. I'm going to repeat it one more time, 602-333-2174. If you have trouble getting on, uh, just keep hitting your redial button. We sometimes have an awful lot of callers, but eventually you'll get through. Good evening, you're on the air. Oh, uh, I sure appreciate it. Uh, my name is Herb, and I'm calling from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And what I was wondering um, is, what is some of the latest uh, analysis uh, that you have on the operations with uh, all the uh, black international uh, gear and, uh, and fits in and, and those areas? Have you heard of anything significant lately? Well, number one, we haven't identified anything black as being international. Everything we've identified belongs to United States uh, organizations or agencies. Uh, some of the secret uh, uh, intelligence organizations or Department of Defense, some of not-so-secret uh, origin, but all of the United States. And, uh, no, I don't, I, we don't know anything more than what we've already reported on the air. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for calling. Number once again, 602-333-2174. And I'm going to let you know, folks, uh, some of the other, well, the conglomerate that built the Las Vegas Luxor Hotel, Luxor means the source of light, by the way, uh, is the Circus Circus Organization. They own Circus Circus Hotel Casino in Las Vegas, the Excalibur Hotel Casino in Las Vegas. Both of those, by the way, have uh, mystical significance. The Circus Circus uh, was used, uh, or the Roman Circus was used by the Roman emperors to keep the public pacified so that they would not rebel against the emperor. The Excalibur, of course, is all about the grail legend of the Knights of the Round Table, which, by the way, has nothing to do with the cup that Jesus drank out of at the Last Supper but represents, in fact, the blood line of the family, which the mysteries believe has the divine right to rule. Uh, they also own Slots of Fun Casino and Silver City Casino in Las Vegas. In Reno, they own Circus Circus Hotel Casino. And in Laughlin, the Colorado Bell Hotel Casino and the Edgewater Hotel Casino. If you think that you're going to get rich going to Las Vegas and playing or gambling, uh, you're wrong because the $400 million cash that built the Luxor Hotel was paid for by all of you who go and gamble at the hotels that I just read you the names of. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, I'm calling from New York. 
Uh, I had heard today on the news uh, something that uh, oh, I had heard on one of your programs earlier about the uh, 2010 Space Odyssey deal uh, with the satellite going around Jupiter. Uh -huh. And on the news today, I heard that uh, by this July, they expect uh, astronomers to be able to witness the first time uh, a comet would ever hit the planet Jupiter. Very convenient, don't you think? Yes. Uh, <laughs> As far as I knew, though, that was supposed to happen around the year 2000 with the satellite, with the plutonium, is it? Well, that's what uh, we were going by the schedule that NASA gave us. They can change that schedule any time they want. That craft out there already? Or? Well, supposedly it's not supposed to be there until 1995. Oh, I we have no idea how fast it's really going. We have to re rely upon what they tell us. Not only that, but they could just be preparing the public for this, and maybe nothing is going to happen when this supposed comet hits Jupiter. Um, but it would lay the groundwork for a good explanation at a later time. I could share with you, Bill, that when I was in Texas, uh, there was an article in one of the local papers about this comet that was supposed to land near or on Jupiter. Not land. Next summer, no. Not land, collide. Collide, right. And um, the article itself said that it might, it might not. It might land on the backside and we'd only see flares. It, it managed to get across uh, a dozen ideas in one little article. And I think Bill is right that it was preparing us for something that could happen soon or uh, by the year 2000. Are you there? Uh, I'm an uh, amateur astronomer with the AAVSO. And... Uh, Jupiter is just short of being a star. That's correct. If, if this was to happen, of course, uh, like they said on the news today, it could create a, an atomic explosion. It's composed mostly of hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> Fits the bill quite well. Yes, very much so. Uh, you're an animal, an, uh, amateur, start to say animal astronomer, I'm sorry. Uh, amateur astronomer, uh, you, have you ever uh, really taken some time to observe the moon for long periods of time? Yes, I have, as a matter of fact. Have you ever witnessed any of the reported transient phenomena, as they call it? Uh, transient phenomena? Yeah. Explain what your... Uh... Uh, shadows that appear and disappear, uh, strange lights and craters. These things have been reported for many years by amateur astronomers. Professional astronomers ignore it. Oh, yes, I had heard about that. Uh, no, I've never really seen anything like that. Uh, I have seen some... Uh, strange uh, uh, phenomena, mainly uh, looking towards the constellation Lyra, which would be in the summertime directly above your, your zenith. Uh, to me, uh, I don't know, uh, as far as looking at the moon, it, it looks pretty desolate, and uh, I've never seen any sign of any lights. I've heard about that, though. Wait a minute. How can you say you've seen some strange transient phenomena looking toward the constellation uh, was it Libra, you said? No, Lyra. Lyra, no. and not tell us what it was. I mean, you just left me hanging there like I got my fingernails dug in on the edge of a cliff. Well, I don't want to foster any belief in uh, UFO, but uh, to me... Uh, well, just because you saw something doesn't automatically mean it's UFO. No, but it was un unidentified as far as I was concerned. Uh, whatever it was, it was... Uh, uh, it looked mostly like it was composed of light, uh, Perhaps, I don't want to say disc-shaped, but it was oval. And uh, at times it would stop and uh, appear to be a star and then whisk away uh -huh. at 90 degree angles. And to me, I just attributed that to whatever aurora phenomena they're, they're trying to pull off or whatever. Well, it could be. It could be some high atmospheric phenomena. Who knows? Nobody really knows. But it's interesting. It intrigues me to no end. Thank you for calling. Very good. 602-333-2174. Folks, by the way, make sure you get the January uh, 10th, 1994 issue of Time Magazine, and you will begin to get a hint of what I'm talking about. The Luxor. By the way, uh, what seems to be a reflection on the left side of the cover of the Sphinx is not. In fact, it is the head of a cobra in human form, and you can tell that by just looking down beneath the chin, and what appears to be the beard of an Egyptian is really, as you will see if you go through the tour of the hotel, continues on down and becomes the body of a snake, which is the symbol of these people, 
and is the ancient symbol of wisdom and Lucifer and uh, all of these different strange cultic things uh, that we've been studying for many, many years and 32 hours on the hour of the time. Good evening, you're on the air. Ah, uh, yes, I made it through. Uh, I heard you talking about the Luxor. That is a nice hotel. Have you been there? I worked on it. Oh, you worked on it? I was one of the ones who was working on the construction of it. Oh, fantastic. Oh, yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? <clears throat> it is beautiful. I mean, it's just beyond description. I, I don't know the words in order to put it to it. Do you remember the the size of the base of the pyramid? Uh, it's larger than the uh, it's larger than the pyramid in uh, Egypt. Uh, the large one there. The yeah, well, I was aware of that you could just look at it and tell that it covers so many acres that the size of this thing is absolutely incredible. Yeah. And on the outside, until you get up close to it, it kind of fooled you. And then you get up close to it and you begin to realize how big it really is. And then you walk inside. Were and, you able uh, to see it uh, when the sun was shining on it? Yes. Oh, man. If you're up on the expressway, you're passing by, you have to put your hand up because it's so bright with the sun shining off it. Yeah, it is truly, uh, in a literal sense, the source of light. Yeah. Okay, now, what I called about was uh, I've been listening to you over about the last six months, and you were talking about the mystery schools and about... Uh, uh, through the Masons. Mm -hmm. Well, about in 1980, I became really curious about what was making politics go. And so I started looking around and I found a group that was... You know what? We've got to stop right here because we've got to take a break right now. There's nothing we can do about it. So just hold on and we'll get right back to you. Okay. And we take you back to the Luxor and our friend who helped build this fantastic piece of architecture. You were about to tell us a story. Okay. Uh, about, I was in 1980 or so, within 1980 or the last part of it. I became interested in politics. And uh, so I started to look around. I found a group that was talking about the same stuff that you're talking about with the Trilateral Commission and the CFR and all the, and they laid it all out, but they didn't give me a who was doing what to who exactly. So I started to look around a little bit, and I found an occult group, and I found it quite interesting, and I joined. And I didn't go in through the, the Mason level. I went in through the occult level into the Illuminati part of it, at least into about the first five or six levels of it. It was very interesting, and you're very... You're very correct in that I don't know about the Mason part of it, but well, for this other direction, it matches up almost identical, identical with what you're talking about. And well, let me correct you. On, let me correct you on one thing. It's it's not the Freemasons. It is the higher degrees of Freemasonry, and uh, most, if not all, of the other secret societies, all of the ones, in fact, that have their membership organization in the shape of a pyramid with a whole bunch of slathering idiots at the bottom thirsting after the secrets and just a few at the top who really know what they are. Well, it, it actually is a religion, and they operate in groups of three. Uh, two people will, won't know who the third person is, and, uh, and, and, and that's the way it is into each group that it goes into a group of three. Yeah, it's the cell system. See, Joseph McCarthy was on the right track. He was just calling them by the wrong name. He called them communists, and the communists worked in the same cell system, but the communists are just another outpouring of this same mystery religion that's had the world in turmoil for thousands of years. Well, the, the outcome, well, I know how to basically avoid them and, and what's coming, I hope. Well, you were a fellow traveler. Well, I, I, I stepped in the middle. There's two sides to the table of when the line starts, and I wanted to make sure I wasn't... I wasn't going to end up in one of the lines that goes into the chambers because they got bad things planned for us out here as uh, you were calling us the heaters. <laughs> they got bad plans for us. It's, it's, it's not the... They call us the useless eaters. Yeah. But uh, they, uh, the, their idea of what, what is actually going to come down is about maybe 5 or 10% of the, of the world's 
will actually control it that much. Yes. We'll actually have the controls. About 20, another 20% will be allowed to work. You get a work card that will allow you to work, and then the rest of us will be given enough stipend in order to uh, live and uh, survive, maybe. 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 <laughs> they, they don't really worry about that too much. They don't worry about it at all, to tell you the truth. That's, that's pretty well true. It's, but you, you were uh, quoted something from Alistair Crowley of um, do what thou wilt under the whole of the law. Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Right. But the, the, the last part of that is under under the guidance of love. That's the Thelma. Well, it's it's a little more complicated than this. Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, under will, under law. Yeah, but it's under the love of under love. But anyway, well, they're, 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 that's I'm, bullshit. That's a, that's a whole con. These people have no love. They are true sociopaths who have no conscience well, whatsoever. But their idea of love is something else. They have no conception of what love is. <laughs> they they <laughs> operate from a pure uh, from a pure point of what they call uh, the intellect. If you allow emotions, this is their philosophy, if you allow emotion of any kind to interfere with your reasoning and with your reaching your goal, no matter what means you have to use to reach that goal, then you are not qualified to be a leader. True, but you're not, you channel, they teach you to channel the emotion. But it, it's not a really a good thing. It's not something. But see, they're not just doing this with action, with uh, with physically doing this stuff with action. They're doing this stuff on a, when you're talking about a cult. The, a cult is quite real. I mean, just because you don't see the wind, don't mean they don't blow. Well, I, I know that. They that they're operating on. I know that. I have witnessed ritual magic. I have seen it work. I know how dangerous it is. And, well, that's, uh, that's the level they're working on, and that's that's how come people are going out into the world and doing scre screwy things is because the energy is being put out in order to affect certain people. Well, hopefully, uh, protect is enough myself that uh, <laughs> I can at least survive out my time. <clears throat> yeah, well, I've heard that story before. <laughs> Either get in and help us fight this stuff. Or, you know, okay. jump off a bridge. That's I'm that's sure. that's my philosophy. You're either for us or against us. I thought went about a couple of years ago, Matt. As soon as I can, I'll buy a couple more shares. <laughs> good. Oh, uh, good. Um, I wanted to ask you if you were given any instruction when you were working on the Luxor to not talk about it. Did you have to keep things secret? Well, you had to be extremely careful about 20 people died building it. Yeah, there's all kinds of stories about that. What happened? Uh, platforms would give away. Uh, you'd set something down and it would move. Uh, uh, it was just, it was, it was an odd building to build. And then the, the energy that was being channeled, the energy that's being channeled through that place is just unreal. You you walk inside, and you know you were talking about the the obelisk there. You can walk in there, and you get a charge just on from it. You look at it, and go, wow! Look at the energy coming off that thing. Well, that's the feeling that you get. I can certainly vouch for that. I spoke to uh, three different employees who were in various parts of the hotel. None of them knew who I was. All three said it was haunted. It is. Do you know by who? By what? It's it's a. Uh, it's a, uh, it's not just a, it's an energy channel. It's, it's haunted by, I don't know whether it's haunted by the people that died on the project, but it's haunted, it's, they, they, they say it's haunted, but what it is is it's a, it's a doorway in between two, two parallel universes. That's what I was trying to describe to the earlier audience when I said I saw this beam of light shoot up from the obelisk uh -huh. to the apex of the pyramid and the, the chill went up my spine, and the hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I knew that, uh, that, that, that this, was, this was much, much more than anybody around me even understood, that this had to do with occult things that the average person could never understand. Oh, yeah. And uh, there, are, there are changes in there that nobody gets access to. 
Well, I want to thank you for calling. We kept you on a lot longer than we normally keep the guests on, but uh, you had some very interesting things to say, and I'm very happy you called. I'll try to get back in months. Thank you. 602-333-2174. Boy, that was an interesting caller. Very, very. <laughs> Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm glad I got to call you. I mean, I've been listening to you for like months and months, and I, I'm a teacher, and I tell my kids about you all the time. Well, thank you. And um, what I would like to ask you, are you saying that there's some kind of occult magic that these people have control of? Yes, absolutely. At least they believe they do, and they should sure uh, made me believe it. The only time in my life I've ever had a chance to witness some of the things that they do. Have you ever read the book um, by Prescott Nicholas? No. Uh, he's the one that said that uh, they went into time back in the 40s. Oh, you you talking about Preston Nichols? Yeah, yeah, Preston. Yeah, I've read all of their books. If you look on the cover of his book, The Montauk Project, you'll discover the secret of Preston Nichols. See that Trojan horse staring at you on the cover? He's laughing at you. Everything in that book is is a lie. Okay. okay. <laughs> I hate to tell you that, but it's true. He is one of them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You keep people running around in circles chasing their own tail. Okay, well, I really glad. Well, one more thing. Um... Um, you said something about, uh... Can you turn your radio off? Oh, okay, wait a second. I knew there was something wrong. I kept playing here with the level, trying to get that out, and, and it's your radio. Okay, um... <laughs> did you say something about possibly it may be a parallel universe that this thing might be hooked into? It's placement? I don't know, but scientists, even Stephen Hawking, has theorized that there could be a parallel universe that somehow... Uh, can sometimes interfere with this one or be hooked to this one. Or, I don't really understand it, but some of the best minds have propounded uh, that theory. You know, it's really interesting um, how I tuned in and I caught you one night when you were talking about Atlantis, the lost continent. Uh -huh. I've always been fascinated with the occult since I'm 43 now, since I was like 15, 18 years old. And I've read all these books, and something led me into hearing you and now that I feel like I'm on to the real thing it's really astounding you know what I mean from my childhood up until now reading these books um, Jean Montgomery um, um, with that lady in Washington D.C. Jean Dixon I read all those books you know uh, if you want to read uh, two of the best books on Atlantis take all the rest of the ones you have and get rid of them and go read Plato uh -huh. and then read Atlantis by Francis Bacon by Francis Bacon yeah Appreciate that. And you'll be on the right track. Okay. okay. Have a good night, then. You too. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, the number is 602-333-2174. This has been a very interesting evening with some very good calls and some uh, good uh, conversation here. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the love story. Uh, I stayed there in October. Uh -huh. And wanted to know if you had a chance to see the, the movie, the or Osiris movie. About the obelisk? In Search of the Obelisk, yes. I saw the whole thing. And what's, what's your opinion of that? I mean, the symbology that you saw in it. It's an indoctrination, uh, number one, into the mysteries through an exoteric uh, play acting. The obelisk really represents God, and what you find out at the end of the movie is that man is God. Right. Man will determine his future, not God. And... Uh, uh, the whole, everything is in that hotel. Everything that they're propounding and trying to get across to us. And you'll notice that everywhere you looked was the Enlightened Society for Global Transformation. Yeah, I saw the, em the emblem and the t shirts they had in the little uh, gift shops and that. Yeah, and whether you know it or not, it's a real society. I, I, I've never seen it before until that time that I've been there. You know? Get into New Age books and publications and you'll find them real quick. Interesting. Uh, yeah. About the energy level that they talk about, uh, a pyramid of creating energy levels at certain heights within it. Uh, you know, with most of it's hollow down, you know, down to uh, the, you know, the base, except for, you know, the theater and some of the other, um, like, for example, you know, they have the skyline of, the, of New York or something like that. I thought that was a lot of wasted space. But oh, I thought it was impressive. I was... Uh, no, no, I mean, I mean, it's, there's something inside that, but there's nothing, but nobody, as far as goes inside those. Well, you don't know that. Uh, you don't know what's inside those, neither do I. Exactly. 
exactly. I mean, <laughs> be an ideal place for some type of, of you know, of platform or something. Personally, I think a lot more goes on there than just people staying at a hotel. Very good. I just wanted to tell you, you know, I stayed there and you know, it was very interesting. <laughs> you know, as far as, you know, I had a funny feeling about it the whole time yeah. I was there. So. How'd you feel? Uh, what did you get out of the uh, the search in search of the obelisk? Well, I thought it was uh, you know definitely right along with the New Age movement and as far as the uh, you know the secret societies and stuff. I mean, I'm not, I'm pretty ignorant to it at this point, but I mean, it's, it's from what I knew of it in generalities, I mean, it's, it was saying that all the way through it. I mean, just with the going back in the, you know going back in the past and into the future and and you know the different uh, realities or the different outcomes. Uh huh. You know, I just thought, you know, you know, just, and it was just, it was, it was not exactly uplifting. It was kind of a sickening movie to me. I mean, it kind of just kind of let you kind of drain. Most people didn't understand what anything about it. I mean, they just went out of there with this vague feeling that they went on a carnival ride and didn't understand that they got a message at the same time. It was, it wasn't Disney World. That's for sure. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Well, very good, then. Thank you for calling. Thank you. 602-333-2174. Good evening, you're on the air. Okay, let me turn it down, okay? Hold on. Good. <laughs> Please turn it down. That was a loud one. When, when did the Luxor open? Do we have I'm not time? really sure. True. But it wasn't long ago. Hey, that was only the second time I ever called you. Come from Syracuse. Uh-huh. What can we do for you? Great pleasure to talk to you. I've been listening to you for a long time, and I can't believe it took this long to finally... You know, straighten me out on, on what's going on. Well, most people, when they first hear this broadcast, they think that I'm a, a absolute raving lunatic and should be locked up immediately. But after they listen for a few programs, and especially if they go down to their library and try to prove it wrong, uh, they do a quick turnaround. Well, after 20 years, I finally got a library card, and uh, I looked up a couple of things, and, uh, you know, you're right on. Good. Absolutely. And I, I do have the uh, that time with Alexa over there, and the uh, the front page looks like it was almost doctored up or something. Well, it was. What you well the 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 uh, picture on the right is an actual photograph. That's exactly the way it looks. I mean, that's how beautiful and incredible it is. The left, where you see the uh, the head with the snake's body and the uh, the eyes gleaming like two stars. Right. That's a touch up. That's that was put in there. Uh, a Chinese friend of mine told me today that the the sphinx may have been uh, damaged by water erosion uh, that, that was interesting he uh-huh. talked about that today and it, it, its origins may have gone back more than 10,000 years well I'll tell you what when you get into the history of the pyramids and the sphinx uh, there is so much that is not known about them uh, the only thing that we really know is that in the time of Plato they were ancient right. and Plato was initiated in the great pyramid as he lay in the sarcophagus for three days and nights during which he was imparted a secret knowledge that he was uh, to guard and, and uh, to use, but never to reveal. Pythagoras spent 20 years in Egypt trying to get the priests to initiate him before they finally did. Did you figure out where your power outage was there this evening? Or? No, we got strange stuff around here. We got GTE, and we got, <laughs> we got an old house, and uh, you thought you could need diesel fuel. When it rains, strange <laughs> things happen, and uh, you know, uh, without with no reason at all, sometimes the right. uh, power so, will just go off. And sometimes the facts that's talking to you. It's not haunted. It's just the strange electronics around here. It's old. You guys uh, bomb out on 5810, and I hope that WWCR does not move you. I heard they want to move their channel, but uh, you're in a great spot right now. Well, they just want to move us up to 5890. I'll tell you what, that'll put you into the middle of the, that whole mess up there in 49 meters, but actually down here, you're in the clear. You know? Well, the problem is, is uh, the Illuminati are very smart, you see, and they run most of the companies, and they make these radios that will not pick up these, yeah, yeah. these uh, bands. They won't pick up the 41-meter band. They won't pick up this this uh, frequency down here. And any place where Christian uh, broadcasts are being uh, aired, or where yeah, people are airing the, over there, yeah, or where people are airing the truth, uh, they they won't put those bands on their radios. I noticed that, and by you know looking at radios that around, I tell people if you really want to hear this stuff, get get yourself an older radio, general coverage radio. 
then you'll pull it all in. Yeah. Well, nowadays, there's so many people broadcasting, you really have to have a digital synthesized tuning radio, or else uh, you'll be just black. You, uh, the other stations run right over you. Okay. One quick question, um, and, and I'll hang <coughs> uh, any update on the, uh, what's going on in Waco. I'll let you go. Yeah, the only update that's going on in Waco is just exactly what I predicted. Nobody showed up down there except about maybe 24 people from the uh, the uh, fully informed jury association and uh, fully news blank. And and there's a news blank. Well, look at here's how the sheeple are. You got a hundred reporters yep. at the penis trial, and you got maybe three down in Waco. I'm um, down but in San Antonio. Well, it's, uh, I don't think that this woman had anything to do with the Illuminati. <laughs> I mean, you know, people can only focus on one trial at a time, so they might as well put this one in the focus. No, it's the sheeple factor, my friend. People have penises running around in their heads, and they don't give a damn about the rights of that church in Waco, Texas. Okay. Well, listen, have a good evening. You too. Thank you for calling. And for those of you out there who swear that your ears are virgin, I did not mean to insult you with that language, but on this program we tell only the truth. Good evening, you're on the air. Hi, Bill. I wonder if you saw an article that was in today's paper picked up by the Cox News Service about Waco? Uh, no, I don't believe I did. Can I read three sentences to you? Sure. Okay, it says, calling for the appointment of a commission to review the policies and practices of all federal agencies, including law enforcement, a diverse group of political organizations from the ACLU to the NRA charged yesterday that the rapid growth of federal law enforcement agencies in the past two decades has produced widespread abuses of civil liberties and human rights. The request made in a letter to President Clinton was prompted in part by the tragedy that occurred last year when agents of the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms raided the branch Davidian Cult's armed compound near Waco. The groups allege that the events in Waco are part of a pattern of abuses of authority by federal agents, including the improper use of force and the frequent use of unreliable informants. Well, that's a surprise coming from the ACLU, who have... Uh who have been a pain in the ass, to tell you the truth, but that's, uh, I, that's good. It's interesting to see something uh, in this kind of a venue that I, I've never seen before. I'm 46 years old. I've been following this stuff, uh, including your research, for a number of years, and I've never seen anything quite like a group of people, different groups, coming together to uh, file lawsuits, seek commissions, do anything in favor of the people concerning the actual pattern of abuse over a period of decades by the federal government. I mean, it looks good on paper here in the paper today. Yeah, yeah, it does. Unfortunately, it gives you the impression that a lot of people understand what's going on in, in, uh, and are beginning to wake up, and that's just not true. Uh, people are waking up, but nowhere near the numbers we need. But I'll tell you, if, if we just get some more time and this continues, it will eventually escalate because each person who wakes up wakes up 10 more. And so the more that wake up, uh, exponentially it grows to the point where eventually, if they give us enough time to affect this awakening, we will preserve our freedoms and our, and our sovereign uh, creator-endowed rights. If not, there's going to be a hell of a civil war in the United States of America. I can guarantee you that, and not because I say so or because I want it, because I don't. The purpose of my doing this broadcast to wake people up is to prevent bloodshed. But I, I, I speak to patriots all the time. People take me into their confidence. I've been taken to sites and shown things that tell me that there's going to be uh, blood hip deep in the streets of America if we don't affect this awakening. Well, uh, I, I've heard on another one of the programs on shortwave uh, concerning the gathering of the guns, uh, putting it together with uh, the book out and many other people's beliefs uh, concerning the... Um, bankruptcy of America in 1995 by virtue of the fact that we will not be able to pay the interest on the national debt we can't. by that time, and so by then, the fact that we'll be bankrupt ought to dovetail really nicely with getting the guns out of most of the hands of good citizens that they're trying to do right now. Sure. They'll sell their guns to feed their kids. Listen, we got to go, and thank you for calling. Take care. 
Well, folks, that wraps it up for another night of the Hour of the Time. Remember, if you want to order the Luxor video, if you want to get a head start and get some of the first copies, $30 for non-CADGI members, postpaid, $25 for CADGI members, postpaid. Good night, everybody, and God bless you all. Welcome once again to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. Last night, during this time slot, I neglected to do what I said I was going to do at the beginning of the program, and people have been calling all day, both my house and here, wanting to know how to get hold of the Luxor tape and what the price is and all of that kind of thing. A lot of people are interested in it, and they should be. You all should be interested in this videotape. Uh, I'm very proud of it, and it's going to it'll be about two weeks in production, and uh, then we'll be ready to send out if you want to get an advance order in so that you can get one of the first copies. And they're always the best, by the way, uh, because they come off a clean master. Uh, as a master is used, as uh, more and more copies are reproduced off the master, the quality gets poorer and poorer until finally you either have to make another master or, or stop producing the tape, one of the two. So if you would like a copy of the source of Light, which is the name of the tape, The Source of Light, send $30. If you are not, if you are not a CADGI member, send $30 postpaid. That means you don't have to send any postage money. If you are a CADGI member, send $25, $25 postpaid to William Cooper, Post Office Box 1420, Sholo. Spelled S H O W L O W, Arizona 85901. That's $30 if you are not a CADGI member, $25 if you are. Both prices are post paid. To William Cooper, Post Office Box 1420, Sholo, Arizona. 85901, and I'll try to repeat that later in the program, and I apologize to those of you who were waiting with pencil in hand to get the address and the price last night, and I did not give it to you. So you can see where my priorities are, folks. This show is not intended to be here to sell you anything at all. Uh, even the sponsor that we have chosen to sponsor this show was chosen to try to help you in what's coming down the line. We give you information. And we give you a means to protect your assets. And we try, we try as hard as we can to wake up those people who are still sleeping. Don't go away. Got a good, good show for you tonight. But first, we're going to get your blood roaring through your veins. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read to you an article from La Traviata. La Traviata. The December 1993 issue. And uh, I'm going to read this to you so that you'll know that I'm not the only one out here who's stark raving mad, as some of you tend to think. I want you to hear that not only, not only have I reached the conclusions that I have reached through years and years of diligent and very, very deep research, but many others have reached the same and I mean the very same conclusions. This is entitled, Secrets in the Vatican II, The Church and the Secret Societies, A Brief History. Pay close attention, and as always, ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you have a tablet and a pen or pencil by your side at all times when you listen to the hour of the time. At a recent Church of England synod, a report on Freemasonry was presented to the assembled clerics and laypeople for debate. Several speakers denounced Masonry as contrary to the teachings of Christianity and condemned Christians, especially clerics, who might be members. One speaker even went so far as to attack Masonry as blasphemous because he claimed its central initiation ritual which involves a symbolic death and rebirth enactment, was a travesty of the Christian belief in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Since its inception, Freemasonry has been the target of Christian wrath. 
In the inner circle of masonry, among those who have obtained higher degrees of initiation, there are masons who understand that they are the inheritors of an ancient and pre-Christian tradition handed down from pagan times. The medieval masons inherited this secret tradition in the form of symbolic teachings which expressed spiritual truths. These teachings originated in the pagan mysteries which were followed wildly, widely, and wildly in the ancient world. These medieval masons inherited esoteric knowledge from their pagan forebears, and this knowledge was incorporated into the sacred architecture of the cathedrals. Now, I want you to pay real close attention, because during my series on the mysteries, when I found out what was concealed within most of the altars that were built during those times, and I related it to you over the air, many people called me a liar. And you're going to hear verification of this, what was found, not only within the altars, but throughout these cathedrals. So pay close attention, folks. This is very important. When the lodges of speculative, as opposed to operative Freemasonry, were founded in the 17th and 18th centuries, this knowledge was transformed into the symbolism which today forms the basis of Masonic ritual. With the persecution of alternative spiritual beliefs in medieval Christian Europe, the guardians of this ancient wisdom went underground, forming secret societies to preserve their pagan ideals, and these societies became the mysteries. The two major secret societies which were formed in this period, although they only revealed themselves in a public form in the 16th and 17th centuries, were Freemasonry, and the Order of the Rosy Cross. While the Order of the Rosy Cross, or the Rosicrucians, is still a secret society which has received little publicity in modern times, considerable public attention has been drawn to Freemasonry recently. <laughs> oh my. The Masons regarded geometry as the most important of the arts and sciences according to their beliefs. Geometry had been taught by a pre-flood patriarch called Lamech, who had three sons. One invented geometry, another was the first Mason, and the third was a blacksmith who was the first human to work with precious metals. In common with Noah, Lamech was warned of an impending flood caused by the wickedness of humanity and the interference of the fallen angels in world affairs. Lamech and his sons decided to preserve their knowledge in two stone pillars so that future generations would discover it. The Masons believe that one of these pillars was discovered by the Greek god Hermes, also known to the Greeks as Hermes Trismegistus, or Thrice Greatest, and to the ancient Egyptians as the ibis-headed scribe of the gods Thoth, pronounced Tehuti, the so-called emerald tablet of Hermes, is said to contain the essence of the lost wisdom from before the days of the biblical flood. According to occult sources, this tablet was discovered in a cave by the mystic Apollonius of Tyana, who was regarded by the early church as a rival to Jesus. The first published version of the Emerald Tablet dates from an Arabic source of the 8th century A.D., and it was not translated into Latin in Europe until the 13th century. However, the myth of the Hermetic wisdom had a profound effect on the Gnostics, who were her her heretical Christians in direct conflict with the early church for attempting to fuse paganism with the new Christian faith. They also claimed to possess the secret teachings of Jesus, divulged to only his inner circle of disciples. Masons claimed these teachings were censored from the authorized version of the New Testament, which was approved by the church councils who met to decide the structure and dogma of early Christianity. In medieval Europe, Gnostic philosophy emerged in the rise of the heretical Christian sect, the Cathars, and the rise of the chivalric order of the Knights Templar. The Hermetic traditions provided the spiritual inspiration for many secret societies in the Middle Ages, and its influence can be discerned in both speculative Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism. 
In the Masonic tradition, it is said that Masons were first organized into a corporate body during the building of the Tower of Babel. The concept of this tower was to reach up to heaven and contact God, according to Genesis chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. The fall of the Tower of Babel destroyed the common language spoken by humanity and ended the second golden age which followed the flood. The architecture of the tower was King Nimrod of Babylon, who was a mason. According to popular belief, the Hebrews received their knowledge of masonry from the Babylonians and introduced it to Egypt when they were taken into slavery. In Egypt, this knowledge was influenced by the mysteries and the occult traditions of the pyramid builders who were versed in the techniques of sacred geometry. The key to the pagan origins of Freemasonry lies in the semi-mythical story of the construction of King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. This building was regarded as the repository of ancient occult wisdom and symbolism by both the Freemasons and the Knights Templar. To build the temple, Solomon imported masons, artists, and craftsmen from neighboring countries. Specifically, he sent a message to the king of Tyre, asking if he could hire the services of the king's master builder, Hiram Abiff, who was killed in geometry. Who was skilled? <laughs> who was skilled in geometry? Uh, <laughs> Solomon appointed Hiram as the chief architect and master mason of the temple. Hiram completed the temple in seven years. The number is especially significant in occult tradition and Freemasonry, folks. But this achievement was overshadowed by his violent, mysterious death. Hiram was approached by three fellow Masons who demanded the secret of the Master Mason's word. He refused and was beaten to death. They buried him in a shallow grave. They marked the grave with an acacia tree. His corpse was discovered 15 days later. Solomon ordered that his body be exhumed and reburied with a full religious ceremony and honors due a craftsman of his rank. Early Masons historians regarded Hiram Abiff as a symbolic representative of Osiris, the Egyptian god of death and rebirth. In the third degree of Freemasonry, the candidate representing Hiram Abiff is raised from the dead by a special Masonic handshake known as as the grip of the lion's paw or the lion's grip. In both Masonic and Egyptian mysteries, the resurrected God is buried on a hill in a tomb marked by a tree. In Royal Ark Masonry, the candidate for initiation is informed that the sacred name of God is really Jabulon. This name has been deciphered as a coded reference to the two major gods of the Middle Eastern fertility cultus, Osiris and Baal combined with the Hebrew tribal god, Jehovah. In masonry, God is also signified as the great architect of the universe, signifying the importance of sacred geometry, and also indicating that he creates nothing but designs and builds from that which has already been created. The political aspirations of Freemasonry revealed in their influence on the revolutionary movements and proto-socialism of 18th and 19th century Europe can be traced back to the myth of the Golden Age during the reign of Osiris and Isis and before the flood to the Babylonian and Hebrew myths of creation. Occult tradition alleges that Hiram Abiff was secretly a member of an ancient society known as the Dionysian Artificers, who first appeared about 1000 B.C. when the temple at Jerusalem was being erected. They took their name from the Greek god and possessed secret signs and passwords by which they recognized each other, were divided into chapters or lodges ruled by a master, and were dedicated to helping the poor. They established lodges in all the Mediterranean lands, and their influence spread as far east as India. With the rise of the Roman Empire, lodges were founded in Central and Western Europe and in the British Isles. The artificers were connected with another secret society known as the Ionians. Members of this society had settled in Asia Minor and were dedicated to the spreading of civilization, especially in its Greek form, to what they regarded as the barbarian world. Allegedly, the Ionians were responsible for the famous temple of the goddess Diana at Ephesus. 
Architects from this society, together with members of the Dionysian artificers, traveled from Tyre to work on Solomon's temple. Later, the artificers called themselves the Sons of Solomon and used his magical seal, two interlaced triangles representing the union of the male and female energies as their trademark. The artificers who settled in Israel founded the Kassidans, who were a guild of craftsmen skilled in the repair of religious buildings. Now, this new sect was instrumental in the foundation of the mystical Jewish group called the Essenes. The Essenes became famous through the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. In occult tradition, Jesus of Nazareth was an Essene, and there are connections between this group and the medieval Knights Templar. The Dionysian artificers believed that the temples they built had to be reconstructed according to the principles of sacred geometry, which reflected the divine plan of God. They constructed religious buildings to represent the human body as a symbol of the universe. They also promoted the political idea of utopia on earth, which was expressed in symbolic form. The hammer and the chisel of the mason became the cosmic forces which shaped the spiritual destiny of mankind. The Roman architect and master builder, Vitruvius, born in the first century A.D., was influenced by the Dionysian artificers. His theories formed the basis for the architecture of the Roman Empire, and with the rediscovery of classical knowledge in the 16th century, also had an impact on the greatest architects of the Renaissance. Vitruvius's concept of the magical theater representing the micro microcosmos of the world as a symbol of the macrocosmos of the universe was repeated in William Shakespeare's famous phrase, quote, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players, unquote. And in the naming of his famous theater, The Globe, it is claimed that Shakespeare was a Rosicrucian initiate who was probably familiar with these ideas. Others take it farther and believe that the Shakespearean plays were really written by Sir Francis Bacon. In the Sonic tradition, Caesar Augustus is the patron of the Masons in ancient Rome and is said to have been Grandmaster of the Roman College of Architects. This society was organized into guilds with symbols based on the tools of their trade, such as the plumb line, the square, compasses, and the level. The college had initiation rituals involving the pagan myth of death and rebirth, which are familiar from the Egyptian mysteries. A temple built and used by the college was unearthed at Pompeii, a city destroyed by the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 71 A.D., among the symbols discovered in the temple were the double triangle of Solomon, the black and white tracing board first used by the Dionysian artificers, the skull, the plumb line, the pilgrim's staff, and the ragged robe. The black and white tracing board was later seen on the battle flag of the Knights Templars. And then again, on the floor of the cathedral as charts. built by the Knights Templar. These symbols later emerged in medieval masonry and also speculative Freemasonry. The traditions of the Roman college seem to have been passed on to the order of Comacene masters who flourished during the reign of the emperors Constantine and Theodosius in the 4th century A.D., when Christianity was emerging as the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. According to legend, the order was founded by ex-members of the Roman College who were forced to flee from the barbarians. They set up their headquarters on the island of Comacini in Lake Como, and in 643 were placed under the patronage of the King of Lombardy, who gave the order control over all the masons and architects in Italy. The Comacene order was divided into lodges ruled by grand masters, wore white aprons and gloves, and recognized each other by secret signs and passwords. The order was responsible for the Lombardy and Romanesque styles of architecture and can be seen as the link between the architects and masons who built the pagan temples and the master builders who erected the Gothic cathedrals of Western Europe in the Christian Middle Ages. 
There is evidence that the Comacini Masons traveled all over Europe, and according to the historian Beattie, even reached Anglo-Saxon England where they built a church in Northumbria. Although the Masons who built the medieval churches and cathedrals were nominally Christian, the proliferation of pagan symbols and images in these ancient buildings indicates many of them were still pagans at heart. And folks, this is what I explained to you about the pyramidal structure of organization in these secret society. Those at the bottom may go to a Christian church and really believe that they are Christian or attend other religions. But as they progress through the degrees of initiation, they are indoctrinated into the old pagan religions and the old gods come back to them with a vengeance until they reach the top. They are no longer Christian. They no longer worship Allah or Buddha or any of the gods or religious beliefs that they had before. They're all gone by that time and that's the purpose. You see, if those at the bottom were exposed all at once to what they would eventually learn through going up the degrees of initiation, none of them would stay long enough to get to the top. It is a process of slow, slow, but sure brainwashing. And it works. It works very, very, very good. Pagan symbols found include the Shila Magid. These are crude representations of the naked female form in the shape of a woman with spread eagle legs displaying their genitals. They have been identified as images of the pagan goddess of fertility worshipped in Celtic times. Other carvings found in medieval churches depict monks and priests in sexual poses with wanton young girls performing homosexual acts are wearing the heads of animals. Even stranger examples of pagan masonry can be found. Professor Gregory Webb of Cambridge University, England, in 1946 Secretary of the Royal Commission on Historical Monuments and an authority on medieval architecture, at the end of the war was appointed by the British government to survey ancient churches in southern England which had been damaged by the German bombing. In one of the churches, he discovered that a Nazi bomb had dislodged the top of the altar, revealing the interior for the first time since the 14th century. Inside the damaged altar, Webb and his team discovered a stone image of a phallus, phallus, the phallus, in fact, of Osiris, which had been carefully concealed within the hollowed interior. At first, Webb, at first, They thought that this discovery was unique until he began to examine other churches. He found that virtually all, virtually all, ladies and gentlemen, of the pre-Reformation churches built before the outbreak of the bubonic plague at the end of the 14th century, when church buildings ceased for a long period, had altars which hid fertility symbols, phalluses, which dedicated the Christian churches to the old pagan religion, the phallus, or the religion of Osiris, which came from the ancient religion of Babylon, where the phallus represented the generative force, Baal, who was also known as Nimrod. So you always learn something listening to the hour of the time. The public image of protective associations using their powers to promote fair trade and business ethics concealed the fact that the medieval society of Freemasons was a secret society with pagan origins, clandestinely promoting radical political opinions, socialism, the occult initiates, who were the real power behind the secret societies, knew that to achieve their aim they had to use the political system, and in the 12th century they began to put their plan into operation. It is known as the great plan of the great work. It is what is bringing the new world order to fruition into the world. The relationship between the Pope and the Grand Masters of the secret societies, ladies and gentlemen, was an explosive one. The Church regarded the members of the secret societies as spiritual anarchists who were 
agents of satanic conspiracy against organized religion. The church saw them as competitors for their flock, the sheep. The Freemasons and Rosicrucians styled themselves as wolves and believed that the sheep belonged to them and were their legal and lawful prey. The Freemasons and Rosicrucians, on the other hand, also accused the church of suppressing the true teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. And many secret societies were fervently anti-clerical. They plotted the overthrow of the Catholic Church because it opposed the old pagan religions and the Manichean heresy from which these groups drew their spiritual inspiration. Ah, if they only knew that the Catholic Church had already done it long ago. And that's why they feared the secret societies as competitors. At first, secret societies were supported by the church. When the Vatican perceived the secret societies to be a political and ideological threat to the church, the climate of suspicion, suspicious tolerance began to change, culminating with King Philip of France wiping out the order of the Knights Templar in the 14th century. In the lodges of Freemasonry, and the actual orders of Templars, they attribute the date of the execution of Jacques de Molay by burning at the stake to the year 1313. Other references give the year 1314. The Council of Nicaea, convened by the Roman Emperor Constantine in the 4th century, rejected pagan beliefs, at least that's what they said, such as reincarnation, which were held by early Christians, and presented Jesus as God incarnate, rather than a human spiritual teacher. Our contemporary knowledge of the Gospel of Mark dates back to 1958, when an American professor of theology, Dr. Morton Smith, discovered references to it in a letter by Clement, preserved in a desert monastery. According to Smith, the inner teachings of Jesus were passed by him to his disciples during the initiation rite, which resembled those of the pagan mysteries. Smith interprets the ritual communion meal practiced by early Christians as a pagan rite descended from the mysteries of Isis and Osiris. It was this esoteric interpretation of Christianity which was accepted by the medieval secret societies rather than the version offered by the church. After a brief lapse to pagan worship during the reign of Julian, the Christian religion quickly reestablished itself in Rome, and under the emperor Theodosius, 378 to 395 AD, the worship of the old pagan gods was finally prohibited. The ideological battle between the popes and the Roman emperors they created raged for several hundred years. The point where we can discern the beginning of these secret societies' influence in this power struggle was in the reign of Frederick II, crowned as Holy Roman Emperor in 1215. With his death in 1250, the Holy Roman Empire collapsed. The Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the First Lodge in Carolina in the United States received its charter from Frederick of Prussia. For 20 years, Europe was devastated by war until, in 1273, the concept of the old empire was revived with the crowning of a new Holy Roman Emperor, Count Rudolf von Habsburg, or Habsburg, meaning Castle of Hawks, in Austria. For the next 300 years, under the patronage of the Vatican, the Habsburgs extended their empire throughout Europe, based on their temporal power and the spiritual power of the Roman Catholic. Well, I just know you're all up there twisting all around the living room, aren't you? How many of you can still do it? Well, before we went on the air, Sugar Bear and I and Carolyn were doing it. And the reason I'm playing this music tonight is just kind of take everybody back to when times were really good in this country. They're trying to convince us that times were no good during the 50s and the early 60s, and that's a lie. And those of us who lived during that period know that it was the best time in the history of this country for the common man. Everyone had work if they wanted it. 
The American dream was becoming realized by more people than ever before in the history of this country. And what's happening now? The American dream, just since that time, has disappeared for most young people. Unless they really strike it rich or get into a profession that really jerks the money out of people's pockets. They have no hope of owning their own home for many, many, many years, if ever. Most people in every family now, have to work. And the children are relegated relegated to government-controlled daycare centers. They are, in fact, occupationally orphaned as you struggle just to keep food on the table and a roof over your heads and be able to have a little bit left over for some recreation once in a while. Those of you who have managed to accumulate assets are in danger of losing them at any moment. Any moment you could find yourself homeless in the street, I guarantee it. Did you know that any one of your neighbors could call the police and tell them that you're a drug dealer? And that before 3 o'clock this coming morning, your door could come crashing down, black, uniformed, black jacketed, Automatic weapon carrying Gestapo could be in your home, stripping every member of your family, searching every bodily orifice. Whether or not they find any dope, they could still confiscate all of your property, bank accounts, vehicles, and auction them off literally within 24 hours, and there's nothing that you can do about it. Now, recently, the Supreme Court put some restrictions on this, but so far, it has not slowed them down, nor has it stopped them. And a recent memo from the Justice Department has chastised government law enforcement agencies for not meeting their quota, their quota of confiscated property from the citizens of the United States of America. There's only one thing that can save you from all of this and from what's coming, from an economic collapse is to get wealth in the form of non-confiscatable, non-reportable hard assets and put them in a safe place where only you can find them and do not keep any record of these items and make sure you don't tell your mother-in-law that you have them. Call 1-800-289-2646. Do it right now. 1-800-289-2646. That's our sponsor, Swiss America Trading. They're honest. They will help you. You must look around now at the faces of your loved ones. Look at them. If you cannot assure them right now, this moment, that you have taken positive steps to protect them in case any of this should happen to you and your family. If you cannot assure them that they will not be left destitute, you must call Swiss America Trading now. Do it. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. You'll be glad that you did. Bob, you didn't call Swiss America Trading, and I want you to turn around now and explain that to your wife. And I'm continuing with the article. The successful alliance between the Habsburgs and the Vatican was seriously weakened by the actions of one man, a crusading reformer who used the symbol of the Rosen Cross on his personal seal. He was the German monk, Martin Luther. When I revealed that Martin Luther was a member of the Rosy Cross, the Order of the Rosy Cross, and that his personal seal was the Rose and Cross. You should see the piles of letters I got from Protestants who blindly revere this man without knowing anything about him, chastising me for revealing to them the truth. But folks, you can write all the letters you want. You will always get the truth on the hour of the time. We may make some mistakes now and then, and if we do, as we always have done in the past, I will come on the air and correct those mistakes. But we never, ever intentionally give you anything that is untrue. Remember that. Martin Luther's personal seal was the rose and the cross. And he was, in fact, a member of the Order of the Rosy Cross. 
Martin Luther, the man whom many revere as the founder of the Protestant or Protestant movement. The Reformation, allegedly supported by the Rosicrucians and other secret societies who opposed the Catholic Church, swept through Europe. This period of the Reformation represents a key time in history during which the relationship between the Church and the secret societies changed. Changed, folks. With the Reformation, you see, the Church was faced with an enemy within, which it could not destroy without bringing down its own edifice. With the Reformation, the whole concept of organized religion in Europe was revolutionized overnight. And where there had been one church, now, today, there are literally tens of thousands, all with different dogma, different interpretations, all professing to be the only true church, with the only truth, and with the only claim to heaven. Ah, but if you only knew. Many think that the secret societies were instrumental in this revolution. I can tell you absolutely for a fact that they were. Support from the Grand Masters was offered to the religious reformers because the Reformation was recognized as a means to weaken the influence of the Catholic Church in European affairs. In America, sad to say, much of the Catholic hierarchy has taken on this role in modern times. The Reformation effectively emasculated the political power of the Church. It laid the foundation for the Puritan movement, whose members fled religious persecution in Europe to found a new nation in the Americas based on spiritual principles drawn from Rosicrucian sources, and all of our founding fathers were members of these secret societies. And many people have also chastised me for making that claim, but it is easily proved. Easily. The problem with most of you people is you believe blindly what you're told, and you never check anything. Many of you still believe that George Washington chopped down a cherry tree, and when his father asked him who did it, he told the truth. Well, that's all a lie, folks. There was no cherry tree. He never chopped one down. His father never asked him if he did. And I really don't know if he would have told the truth or not. Most politicians don't. Most politicians do not. It also provided an atmosphere of open-mindedness which allowed the seeds of the Renaissance to flower based on the best ideas of the pagan classical world. Although the Habsburgs were to rule for another 300 years until 1806, the Reformation destroyed any hope of a united Europe controlled by the Roman Catholic Church until today. Above everything else, the religious reforms of the 16th century marked the beginning of the period when the Church became determined to exterminate the secret societies which had weakened its power base. I'm not aware that the Vatican has changed its policy one iota from this. In fact, its determination has doubled over the past 150 years, even though today the secret societies flourish in America, and with only a wink from the American Catholic Church bishops. In fact, the Jesuit Society was formed to combat this from another secret order of Illuminati, or the Ilumbrados, in Spain. The head of this group was Ignatius Loyola, who was in fact arrested by the Inquisition. He used his influence with powerful people to gain an audience with the Pope. He went in on his knees and walked out on his two legs with a papal bull, granting him immunity from prosecution from the Inquisition, from any king, queen, country, or law, save one, the Pope. And he was to found a new order, the Society of Jesus, now known as the Jesuits. See the Oath of a Secret Society, which makes up a chapter in my book. And you will see that they are sworn to destroy the Protestant movement and Protestants wherever they can find them. 
Above everything else, the religious reforms of the 16th century marked the beginning of the period when the church became determined to exterminate the secret societies which had weakened its power base. The secret societies, though they claim to follow the precepts of Jesus Christ, actually provide an alternative version of spirituality to their followers. They deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. They deny that he was the Son of God, or was in actuality the incarnated God upon this earth. That he died, or that has, he was resurrected, or that he sits upon the right hand of the throne of God. Instead, he has become an ascended master, a teacher, and Christ has become an office which anyone can attain. You too can become a Christ in the New World Order. They actually provide this alternative version of spirituality, and it is the foundation of what you know today as the New Age Movement. They alleged that the church had deliberately subverted the teachings of Jesus and teach that there are other sources of spiritual knowledge which are as valid as Christian belief and predated it by thousands of years. In 1738, the first papal bull to combat Freemasonry was issued by Pope Clement XII. This bull threatened any Catholic who became a Mason with excommunication, at that time an extremely, extremely serious punishment. In fact, nothing worse could be imagined. In the 1870s, claims that secret societies such as the Illuminati were using Freemasonry as a cover for radicalism and revolution gave the Church fresh charges to level against the Masonic lodges. The climax of the Church's crusade to destroy the influence of Freemasonry came in the 19th century. In 1864, Pope Pius X condemned socialism and the secret societies in his Syllabus of Errors, which he published following an investigation of revolutionary activities in Italy. Every investigation has found that socialism emanates from the secret societies. Twelve months after the publication of the Syllabus, the Pope again condemned the secret societies, specifically attacking Freemasonry as anti-Christian, satanic, and pagan in origin. In 1884, Pope Leo XIII issued a proclamation identifying Masonry as one of the secret societies working to establish Satan's kingdom on earth. He also claimed that Masonry was attempting to revive the manners and customs of the pagans. They have succeeded in a visit to the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. We'll convince you of that. It has often been claimed that the ultimate objective of the secret societies was to infiltrate the Vatican and place their own man on the throne. See my book for the outcome. Some modern critics of the Roman Catholic Church, especially those with ultra-traditionalist views, have seen in the liberalization of the Church in recent years proof that its hierarchy has been penetrated at the highest levels by agents of the secret societies who are working for its eventual downfall. At the celebrations in honor of St. Francis of Assisi in 1986, which stressed the unity of all religions, the Pope participated in a multi-religious prayer for world peace. Traditionalists were horrified to see the pontiff happily share a platform with a Tibetan Lama, a Hindu Swami, a Native American medicine man, a Jewish rabbi, and a Maori high priest. It was noted that the unity of all the world's religions and the recognition that they all derive from the same ancient source is the central philosophy of the secret societies. It is the goal of the World Council of Religions. It was the message of Pope John Paul II in Denver, Colorado. Dear listeners, and he replaced the last pope who tried who tried to be a good pope he was murdered after exactly 33 days in office now i read this from la traviata la traviata the december 1993 issue, I believe. 
Is it the December? Yes, December 1993 issue. To show you that I'm not the only insane person out here who has discovered the truth amongst all the lies. Anyone can do it. I don't know who wrote that. I never saw that paper before. It was sent to me by a Kaji member. The author's name, I don't believe, is listed there. And even if it was, I still don't know him. Anyone who wants to look for the truth and find it will find it. It's not hidden, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, today, even though it began as a conspiracy hundreds and thousands of years ago, today it is all being done in the open. They believe that all of us are so stupid, actually, that they even write books about it, disclosing their whole intentions, all of their plans. Knowing that none of you will ever read those books, and if you did, you wouldn't believe it. And I said, none of you. That's not really true. There's some of you out there who are learning, who are awake, who are struggling, who are fighting this battle with me and with Carolyn, with many others, to try to save the penultimate achievement of all of mankind throughout the history of the world. And that's the Constitution and the Bill of Rights of the United States of America. When I make a statement like that, I always get letters or people call if I open the phone and say, how can you make that statement, Bill, when you just told us that our founding fathers were members of these secret societies? Very simple, folks. Read the writings of the founding fathers. They will tell you themselves. This was a great experiment to see if man was capable of ruling himself. And if he was, this would be the culmination of the great work. But you will also find in their writings that they understood human nature better than any of us do or probably ever will. For they knew, they knew that with the keys built into the Constitution, we would give up our creator-endowed rights and trade them for benefits from the state, thus relegating ourselves back into the old, the old position of owned property. We would become indentured to the state for accepting these privileges. But they knew that people did then, as they do today, except for a very few people who really understand and appreciate freedom and understand the responsibilities and the consequences that go along with it, they understood that most people spend the first 20 years of their lives struggling to become responsible and to be accepted as a man or a woman in their own right, able to be responsible, strike out on their own, build a business, sign contracts. And once they discover the responsibilities and requirements that freedom demands, they spend the rest of their life trying to crawl back into the womb, searching for a daddy, a daddy to take care of them. That's why socialism is so attractive to most people, ladies and gentlemen. It tells them they no longer have to be responsible. Then in exchange for their freedoms, Daddy the State will take care of them. Daddy the State will give them a job. Daddy the State will pretend to pay them if they pretend to work. Daddy the State will provide them with some sort of a hovel in which they can live. So they don't have to worry about paying the rent. Yes, Daddy will even change their diapers and give them clothes to wear. Daddy will tell them what time in the morning they can go out on the street and what time in the evening they must be inside their hovel. Daddy will discipline them. Daddy will make sure that there's no crime to threaten them. Oh yes, many, many people will love the New World Order and the New World Religion. And the new world of entertainment that will be erected in place of the old Roman circus in order to keep the populace entertained and diverted. Mindless libraries will be filled 
with the new history books and the new politically correct dogma of the new politically correct world and the new politically correct religion. And everywhere you look, you will see the symbols of the generative force, the phallus of Osiris, the representation of the old god of Babylon, Baal, Nimrod, Isis will be everywhere. You see, for Osiris is the doctrine, Isis is the church. Horus is the great body of initiates that will rule you. They call themselves wolves. And of course, of course, dear listeners, you are the sheep. The legal and lawful prey of the wolves. A nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden, and yes, stakes on the table by choice and consent. If we didn't love you here, we would not say these things to you. Please wake up, good night, and God bless you all. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. Well, folks, I'm here relaxed. My tonsils, my larynx are completely laid back. And uh, we're supposed to have a guest tonight, but so far he hasn't called. Carolyn is in studio with me. And uh, I don't know what we're going to do because he was supposed to call at about three minutes till... And the phone has not rung yet. So, I don't know if we're going to have a guest or not. So, we'll go right in to a little pre-warm-up here. And uh, see if we can just sort of wait a few minutes to find out what in the world is going on. Notice how calm, cool... And absolutely collected I am tonight. Isn't it wonderful? Well, I don't know what happened, ladies and gentlemen, but we have no guest. So we go to plan B. You should always have a plan B and sometimes a plan C and D and E. And sometimes even plan F. But tonight we only have plan B. The mystery religion of Babylon, ladies and gentlemen, has been symbolically described in the last book of the Bible as a woman arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. The phone is, was, is not now. This is insanity. Absolute insanity. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And that's from Revelations chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. When the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, uses symbolic language, a, quote, woman, unquote, can often symbolize a church. The true church, for example, is likened to a bride, a chaste virgin, a woman without spot or blemish. Check Ephesians chapter 5 verse 27 and Revelations chapter 19 verses 7 and 8. But in striking contrast to the true church, the woman of the text is spoken of as an unclean woman, a defiled woman, a harlot, if it is correct to apply this symbolism to a church system, ladies and gentlemen, then it becomes clear that only a defiled and fallen church could be meant. In big capital letters, the Bible calls her, quote, Mystery Babylon, unquote. Now, when John wrote the book of Revelation, Babylon as a city had already been destroyed and left in ruins as the Old Testament prophets had foretold. 
And you can find that in Isaiah chapter 13, verses 19 through 22, and Jeremiah verses, uh, chapter 51, uh, verse 52. But though the city of Babylon was destroyed, folks, religious concepts and customs that originated in Babylon continued on and were well represented in many nations of the world and exist in secret right up to this very day. Now, just what was the religion of ancient Babylon? How did it all begin, and what significance does it hold in modern times? How does it all tie in with what John wrote in the book of Revelation, if at all? How many of you were aware that the Iraqis have been busy for many years rebuilding the city of Babylon? Turning the pages of time back to the period shortly after the flood, men began to migrate from the east. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Genesis chapter 11, verse 2. It was in this land of Shinar that the city of Babylon was built, and this land became known as Babylonia later as Mesopotamia. Originally, it was a part of the Syrian, the Assyrian, the Assyrian nation. Now here, here, ladies and gentlemen, is where the Euphrates and Tigris rivers had built up rich deposits of earth that could produce crops in great abundance. But there were certain problems, you see. The people faced... For one thing, the land was overrun with wild animals, which were a constant threat to the safety and peace of the inhabitants. And you can check for reference Exodus chapter 23, verses 29 and 30. Obviously, anyone who could successfully provide protection from these wild beasts would receive great acclaim from the people. For all people in all times seek security. It was at this point that a large, powerfully built man by the name of Nimrod, Nimrod, appeared on the scene. He became famous as a mighty hunter against the wild animals. And the Bible tells us, quote, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter, before the Lord, unquote. Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 and 9. Now, apparently, Nimrod's success as a mighty hunter caused him to become famous among those primitive people. He became a, quote, mighty one, unquote, in the earth, a famous leader in worldly affairs. Gaining this prestige, he devised a better means of protection. Instead of constantly fighting the wild beasts, why not organize the people in the cities and surround them with walls for protection? Then, then, why not organize these cities into a kingdom? What a great idea. Evidently, this was the thinking of Nimrod, for the Bible tells us that he organized just such a kingdom. Quote, And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech, and Akkad, and Kala, in the land of Shinar, unquote. Genesis chapter 10, verse 10. The kingdom of Nimrod is the very first government mentioned in the Bible. Whatever advances may have been made by Nimrod would have been well and good, but Nimrod, you see, was an ungodly ruler. The name Nimrod, ladies and gentlemen, comes from Marad and means, quote, he rebelled, unquote. Sound familiar? Was it Lucifer, an angel of light, tremendous knowledge who rebelled against God and was thrown down to the earth to be the ruler of the material world? Well, the word Nimrod means, quote, he rebelled, unquote. The expression that he was a mighty one, Quote, before the Lord, unquote, can carry a hostile meaning. You see, the word before 
being sometimes used as meaning against the Lord. The Jewish Encyclopedia says that Nimrod was he who made all the people rebellious against God. That's taken directly out of the Jewish Encyclopedia. Let me say it again for you. Quote, he who made all the people rebellious against God, unquote. The noted historian Josephus wrote, Now, it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God. The multitudes were very ready to follow the determination of Nimrod, and they built a tower, neither sparing any pains nor being in any degree negligent about the work, and by reason of the multitude of hands employed in it, it grew very high. The place wherein they built the tower is now called Babylon, and those who built it were called the builders. And they still exist, ladies and gentlemen, today. Basing his conclusions on information that has come down to us throughout history, legends, and in mythology, a man by the name of Alexander Hislop has written in detail of how Babylonian religion developed around traditions concerning Nimrod, his wife, Semiramis, and her child, Tammuz. Now, Alexander Hislop wrote this, the results of his research, in a book called The Two Babylons, and I suggest strongly that you make every attempt to get that book and read it. It will open your eyes if you have an understanding of the symbology of the esoteric religion of Mystery Babylon and the secret societies today, which I have revealed to you through the Mystery Babylon series on this radio broadcast. It is important that we understand who these people are and what they believe. It makes no difference whatsoever whether you believe it or disbelieve it. If they hold the powerful positions of the world, if they are pulling the strings that make you dance, then whatever they believe affects you. Make no mistake about that. Now, when Nimrod died, according to the old stories, his body was cut into pieces, burnt, and sent to various areas. Sound familiar? We've discussed this same story before. You see, the first religion is also the last religion, and it has been every religion in between, in various aspects and various forms. It has never changed. His body was cut into pieces, burnt, and sent to various areas. Similar practices are mentioned even in the Bible. Judges chapter 19, verse 29. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 7. Following his death, which was greatly mourned by the people of Babylon, his wife, Semiramis, claimed he was now the sun god. S-U-N, sun god. Later, when she gave birth to a son, she claimed that her son, spelled S-O-N, Tammuz by name, was their hero Nimrod, reborn. And this, again, has been played out throughout the mysteries and throughout every religion, throughout the history of the world. Now, don't misunderstand me, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, by... No means casting any slant or dispersion on any religion that any of you may be practicing. And making no suggestions that you should not be a part of whatever religion you belong to. I'm merely delivering a message of the truth to you all. The mother, <clears throat> excuse me, the mother of Tammuz had probably heard the prophecy of the coming Messiah to be born of a woman, for this truth was known from the earliest times, and you can check Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. She claimed her son was supernaturally conceived, and that he was the promised seed, the Savior, and she gave the first recorded virgin birth. 
to her son, who was Nimrod, reborn from his wife, lover, mother. Tammuz was the child's name, and he was called the promised seed or the savior. In the religion that developed, however, not only was the child worshipped, but the mother was worshipped also. Much of the Babylonian worship was carried on through mysterious symbols. You see, it was a mystery religion. The golden calf, for example, was a symbol of Tammuz, son of the sun god, Nimrod. The calf, or the bull, was actually the symbol during that age of the astrological house through which the sun was moving. It was called, and still is called, Taurus, the bull. Later, when the sun moved out of the house of Taurus and into the house of Capricorn, then the golden calf became the ram, or the goat, and was worshipped in the temple of Mendes, and to this day it is known as the goat of Mendes. Now, every once in a while I slow down for you to make sure that this sinks in, that you really understand what I am telling you. For it is important, ladies and gentlemen, that we stop being deceived and led by our nose. Those who are the puppet masters rely upon us to remain puppets. It's my intention to bring you out of the toy box and into the real world. Since Nimrod was believed to be the sun god, or Baal, fire was considered as his earthly representation. Fire was considered as his earthly representation. Thus, as you shall see, folks, candles and ritual fires were lighted in his honor. And the priesthood was known as the philosophers of fire. They had a habit of burning their enemies, and they still do that today. In other forms, Nimrod was symbolized by sun images, by fish, by trees, by pillars or obelisks, and animals. For you see, if he was the sun god, he was the source of all life on this earth. He was the source of all warmth. He was the source of all energy. He was the generative force, and his symbol was the phallus, or the obelisk. One was erected by our forefathers in Washington, D.C. Centuries later, Paul gave a description which perfectly fits the course that the people of Babylon followed. Quote, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. They changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections." Unquote. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 26. Ladies and gentlemen, this system of idolatry spread from Babylon to the nations. Do you know what nations translates to in the original Hebrew and Greek? It is the word that we know as Gentiles. You see, the nations are the Gentiles. Does that surprise you? So the Gentiles were not corrupted until the system of idolatry spread from Babylon to the nations, to the Gentiles. 
For it was from this location that men were scattered over the face of the earth. You can find that in Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. And as they went from Babylon, they took their worship of the mother and child and the various mystery symbols with them. And the mother was known as the goddess of the sea at a later time. The sea was called the mare, and the goddess was called Mary. Herodotus, the world traveler and historian of antiquity, witnessed the mystery religion and its rites in numerous countries and mentions how Babylon was the primeval source from which all systems of idolatry flowed. Bunsen says that the religious system of Egypt was derived from Asia and the primitive empire in Babel. In his noted work, folks, Nineveh and its remains, Layer declares that we have the united testimony of sacred and profane history that idolatry originated in the area of Babylonia, the most ancient of religious systems, and all of these historians were quoted by Hislop in his book, The Two Babylons. When Rome became a world empire, it is a known fact that she assimilated into her system the gods and religions from the various pagan countries over which she ruled. Since Babylon was the source of the paganism of these countries, we can see how the early religion of pagan Rome was but the Babylonish worship that had developed into various forms and under different names in the countries to which it had gone. Now, bearing this in mind, folks, we notice that it was during this time when Rome ruled the world that the true Savior, Jesus Christ, was born, lived among men, died, and rose again. He ascended into heaven, sent back the Holy Spirit, and the New Testament church was established in the earth. Now, looking at those early days of the Christian church. All of the members were saints. They were all equal unto each other. All of them. It must have been glorious to be a part of that and break away from the old to something that gave a promise. A promise of a better life. You see, in those days, life was terrible. It was uncertain at best. No one knew when they woke up in the morning if they would live to see the nightfall. And it was that uncertain every single day. And all of a sudden, there was a promise. There was a promise. You only have to read the book of Acts to see how much God blessed His people in those days. Multitudes, ladies and gentlemen, were added to the church. The true church. It doesn't exist anywhere today except in small pockets of individuals who meet with each other in Christ's name. All of these organized religions have bastardized the teachings of Christ, have corrupted the teachings of Jesus. And most of them are helping to lead you into slavery in the New World Order. In those days, great signs and wonders were performed as God confirmed His Word with signs following. True. Christianity, ladies and gentlemen, anointed by the Holy Spirit, swept the world like a prairie fire. Nothing could stop it. No matter how many Christians the emperor crucified, no matter how many Christians were thrown to the animals in the Roman circus, one hundredfold sprang up to take their place. This movement encircled the mountains and crossed the oceans. It made kings tremble and tyrants fearful. And it was said of those early Christians that they had turned the world literally upside down. So powerful was their message and spirit. Now, I am talking about the true Christian teachings of Jesus Christ. 
and the way that it was followed in the early days of Christ's church. Not Rome's church, not Baptist's church, not Lutheran's church, not Orthodox church, but Christ's church. Before too many years had passed, men began to set themselves up as lords over God's people in places of the Holy Spirit. Instead of conquering by spiritual means and by truth, by truth, not too many people in the world understand what truth even means today. As in the early days, men began to substitute their ideas and their methods in place of the teachings that Christ gave us. The Inquisition came from these people, not from Jesus Christ. The Crusades came from these people, not from Jesus Christ. Attempts to merge paganism into Christianity were being made even in the days when our New Testament was being written, folks. For Paul mentioned that the mystery of iniquity was already at work already at work, and he warned that there would come a falling away, and some would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, the counterfeit doctrines of the pagans. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 7, First Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And by the time that Jude wrote the book that bears his name, it was necessary for him to exhort the people to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. For certain men had crept in who were attempting to substitute things that were no part of the original faith. Check Jude, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Christianity, folks, came face to face with the Babylonian paganism in its various forms, that had been established in the Roman Empire. The early Christians refused to have anything to do with its customs and beliefs. And we all know what happened. Much persecution resulted. Many, many Christians were falsely accused, thrown to the lions, burned at the stake, and in other ways tortured and martyred. And for their own safety, they went underground in the catacombs and in the caves, and they formed their own secret society, which was known then as the Friendly Open Secret Society, and their symbol to mark their way was a fish. Then, great changes began to be made. The Emperor of Rome professed conversion to Christianity. He had to. For Rome, Rome would have fallen just as sure, just as sure, the tree in the forest falls to the axe. If he had not made that move. Don't go away, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be back right after this very short pause. In those early days of the real church, the real church, Christ's church, who practiced exactly what he taught them, Great, great changes began to take place that have affected us right up to this very day. What a shock it must have been when Constantine professed a conversion to Christianity after stating that he had seen the vision of a cross in the sky. And some accounts say that he didn't see it in the sky during daylight, but he saw it in a dream. And ladies and gentlemen, because he never accepted Christ during his entire life, and in fact was a pagan sun worshiper, I question whether he ever saw a cross at all. You see, because history says and records very clearly that Constantine never accepted Christ as his Savior. He never really followed the teachings of Christ. He was, in fact, a sun worshiper. He practiced the mystery religion of Babylon. But he was, in fact, the emperor of Rome. Rome 
very quickly became, ladies and gentlemen, the Catholic Church, and the Roman Emperor became the Pope. He had to do this to save the empire. The symbol of the Roman Empire and the emperor was the double-headed eagle. It signified that he ruled over both the east and the west, that the sun did not set on the Roman Empire. This symbol still is displayed upon the walls of the Vatican. And just recently, Russia adopted this symbol as its national symbol. It is the symbol of the 33rd degree of Freemasonry. And I could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. But hopefully, you get the point. Imperial orders, ladies and gentlemen, went forth throughout the Roman Empire that persecutions should cease. Simply and quickly cease. Bishops were created and given high honors. The church began to receive worldly recognition and power. But for all of this, a great, great price had to be paid. Many, many compromises were made, ladies and gentlemen, with paganism. Instead of the church being separate from the world, it became a part of this world system. The emperor, showing favor, demanded a place of leadership in the church. For in paganism, emperors were believed to be gods. So from here on, wholesale mixtures of paganism into Christianity were made, especially at Rome. We believe the, the, the information that you're going to receive and have received, in fact, over this broadcast, will convince you that what is known today as the Roman Catholic Church is nothing less then the old Roman Empire transformed and the old Roman pantheon of gods became the pantheon of saints. And the Christian, who began as a saint equal with all of his brothers and sisters, became a lowly peon once again, the title of saint was stripped from him and from her. And uh, someone began to pass a plate and put up collection boxes and demand that at festivals the wealth of the people be transferred into the coffers of the church. Now, I don't doubt that there are many fine, sincere, and devout Catholics. In fact, I know there are. I know there are many devout, sincere, courageous, wonderful members of the Mormon Church, and the Baptist Church, and the Lutheran Church, and the Orthodox Church, and even the Buddhist religion, and Hinduism. I've met these people all over the world. We have all, ladies and gentlemen, been deceived throughout our lives by the secular and the religious priesthood, and in many cases they are the same. They are now engaged in a grand plan to bring about a new world order. The mystery schools to try to keep the mysteries pure, want to rule the world through a council of elders with a puppet, charismatic, religious, and political leader upon the throne of the world. And the Vatican wants the Pope to sit upon the throne of the world and rule without the council of elders. You see, they all united and the efforts to bring about world government, the only point of contention is who is going to rule. And we're, we're the odd card, the joker in the deck. 
For if we want to, we could decide that either one of them will rule. And we could determine the outcome of this battle. And we could reinstitute the real church again upon this earth as it was when Jesus taught it. He did not teach us to war against our neighbor. He did not teach us to condemn or judge our neighbor. In fact, the commandment was, Judge not lest ye shall be judged. When Jesus spoke to a crowd and someone walked away from the crowd, he did not chase them down the road and try to stuff his teachings down their throat. Ladies and gentlemen, he did not do that. Neither did he build great, wealthy cathedrals built of shining glass with great pageants on the holidays and big-name stars to come and sing and perform in these pageants. Where a homeless person or a poor, unemployed man with dirty clothes would be turned away from the door. Jesus Christ would have been the first one who welcomed that person into the church. And if you will look at the people that he habitually associated with, whose homes he slept in, who became his disciples, you will understand that those today who call themselves Christians do not even know the meaning of the word. Do not even know the meaning of the word. Many, many of the ministers, pastors, who stand at our pulpits across this nation and preach the word of God on Sunday, attend the rituals of the Masonic Lodge, on the following Saturday and pay homage to Lucifer. How can this be? How can this be? Now, folks, it's not my intention to treat lightly or to ridicule anyone whose beliefs we may here disagree with. I will be the first one to stand by your side and protect your right to worship at the altar of your choice any time anyone threatens to take that away from you. Whether I agree with your method of worship or your church, or your altar. For I believe sincerely that only by protecting your right to worship at the altar of your choice is my right to worship at the altar of my choice protected. Only by allowing you to speak what you wish to speak is my right to speak what I must speak protected. And everywhere I go, I see Christians who do not practice that at all, yet they claim to be Americans and support the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and claim to be following the teachings of Jesus Christ. And they are not. They are false Christians. And I think... And someday when they go to knock on that door that they're all looking forward to passing through, they will find that it is shut and barred and locked against them. I hope that this program tonight inspires people, regardless of their church affiliation, 
to forsake all the stupid dogma and silly interpretations and the fractures that have created thousands of different divisions of what is supposed to be one church across this nation. Forsake the Babylonish doctrines and concepts and seek a return to the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. The real saints. Not, ladies and gentlemen, the Roman pantheon of gods. I hope tomorrow night to be able to bring the guest who was supposed to be on tonight. He may have called later because the phone was ringing, but once I get into something, I carry it through to the finish. I cannot start something and leave it in the middle. I think tonight's message was important. It was important to me to be able to deliver it. This is not a religious program, folks. It's about lies and deception. It's about the truth. And the truth is, very few people know the truth or practice the truth. Most so-called Christians spend most of their life calling Jesus Christ a liar. They have so twisted his teachings, his simple teachings. They have so turned around everything that is said. They so reach out to find verses in the Bible to promote their own agenda, whatever it may be. And all through the work, they steal from their neighbors and piously attend church on Sunday. And this must stop. It must stop. All of the lies must stop. All of the deceptions must stop. All of the manipulations must stop. We must begin to use our brains tempered with our hearts for cold reason is cruel and intrepid. Those who believe that there is no place in this world or within humanity for emotion are the despots of the world. Conversely, those who believe that the heart should dictate everything are the fools of the world. And after all, as the ancients left us the symbol of the Sphinx to remind us, is nothing but an animal with a brain, and we spend most of our time in conflict between the animal instinct and the brain between the emotions, and desires, and temptations, and what we know to be right. Between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Too few of us are winning these battles, ladies and gentlemen. Too few of us really care. Too few of us really understand the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Too many of us, too many of us are fat and lazy and apathetic and ignorant, pampered, spoiled, rotten. America must change. The change must occur in the people. The people must once again understand what is important and what is not. They must be willing to sacrifice. They must be willing to do whatever is necessary to make sure that the freedom that man has gained throughout his history, culminating in the greatest nation upon the face of this earth, does not disappear from the face of this earth. In the name of some promised world utopian government. 
For anything, ladies and gentlemen, that is created from a mountain of lies to sit upon top of a mountain of lies is nothing but another mountain of lies. And as soon as the truth upon which this mountain is sitting is exposed, the entire thing will come tumbling down. The world brought about by liars through deceit and manipulation cannot be a good thing, will not be a good thing. And those who behind it, who profess to be doing what's best for man, who profess to be acting with the best intentions for the future of mankind, belie that statement when it comes out of the same mouth that promotes the lies, that creates the deceptions, that manipulates the people into it. For if it were going to be so good, no lies would be required, no deceptions would be required, no manipulations would have to take place. All of you who are waiting for Jesus to come into his kingdom, I tell you, he is in his kingdom now. The problems with this world lie with man, have always been with man, and will be with man no matter what he tries to create. No matter how he tries to create it, if it is built by man, it is flawed. The concept that we're going to have a perfect utopian world government where imperfect men are ruled by imperfect men is ludicrous. Absolutely, 100% ludicrous. I want to thank you all for putting up with my demented ravings tonight. I'm kind of glad that our guest didn't show up because this is something that's been burning within me for quite some time. For reference, read Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons and Babylon Mystery Religion Ancient and Modern by Woodrow. Refer to the 33 tapes of our Mystery Babylon series that were aired on this broadcast over the last two years. Good luck, good night, and God bless you.